Thank you for joining us for this regular board meeting of the Santa Clara Unified School District Board of Trustees. It's Thursday, September 14th, and I'm calling this meeting to order at 5.02. We will start with a roll call of attendance. Trustee Canova. Here. Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Lieberman. Here. Trustee Muirhead. Absent. Trustee Raderman. Absent. Trustee Ryan. Absent. And I am here. So we have four board members here. Student Trustee Valdez. Here. Thank you so much. We will now have our introduction of the interpreter. Good evening, board. <clears throat> Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Angelica Benítez. Mi compañera Verónica Adams y yo vamos a ser las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida en el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en su pantalla y seleccione el lenguaje de español. En ese menú también tendrá la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now have our Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by one of our fabulous music teachers, Mr. Tim Bacon. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Trustee Gonzalez will now read our district mission and vision statements. The mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. The vision. Graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. We will now review and accept our agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the President agenda? Fairchild, if I might, we would like to pull item K6 and bring it back at a later date. Okay. Prior to the motion, we are pulling item K6 and Trustee Lieberman. Um, I would like to pull item J5 from consent. Okay. So uh, any trustee can pull any item from consent. So we will pull that item from consent. Um, any other changes to the agenda before we take a motion to approve with those changes? Could I get a motion to approve the agenda with the changes specified? Motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion from Trustee Lieberman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Student Trustee Valdez. Aye. Okay, that passes five to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Okay. I will now read our guidelines for public comment at a board meeting. The Board of Trustees has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, quote, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility and orderly conduct among district employees, parents and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible a safe, harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, SCOSD encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. The district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. We are excited to start our board meeting a little differently today. We are going to have a strategics art plan informational report. And we will do this like we have done any other report. We will allow the presenters to present their information. Afterwards, if the board has comment, the board will give comments and then we will go out to public comment if there are any public comment. So to start off, I will turn the time over to Dr. Gary Waddell. Thank you, President Fairchild. We are very excited 
to be here this evening and share the Santa Clara Unified School District Strategic Arts Plan. This plan is the result of a significant body of work that was done last year and into this year by single subject art teachers, secondary, uh, uh, as well as elementary music teachers, elementary teachers, paraeducators, and administrators in the district. We began this work with a vision for crafting a bold and ambitious plan that would drive the work around arts learning in the district over the next five years. Arts are a core content area in California with an arts framework that was adopted by the State Board of Education in just 2019. The California art standards are based on the national core art standards, which provide a foundation for the development of artistic competencies, cultivation of lifelong appreciation and understanding of the arts. As students develop artistic literacy, the ultimate goal of arts learning for California students is they develop transferable skills that enhance their personal, academic, and professional endeavors. State Superintendent Thurmond and State Board of Education Chair Linda Darling Hammond note that every child in California, every child in California, should have an equitable access to high quality, standards based arts education to thrive and participate in modern society. As former chair of the California Arts Education Subcommittee, I know the power of arts learning throughout the grade spans, and I'm particularly proud for Santa Clara Unified to lead the way in this work. We are fortunate to have such skilled and thoughtful teachers and leaders who served on this committee. The leadership group that guided our process are here with us this evening to present their work, and we owe, uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude, as well as to our friends at the California Arts Project, who facilitated our process. We will use this map, this plan as a map as we navigate both Prop 28 funds and other art spending for the district. As I hand it over to them, I'd just like to add that high quality standards-based arts learning today is a dynamic and rigorous area. Gone are the days when arts meant doing a craft activity after a unit or that we were content if students got access to arts when their other content was done or when arts were an artifact of the affluence of a family or a school. But rich arts learning is the right of every child, and we are excited to lead the way in this space in Santa Clara Unified. I task at the beginning of this work the planning group to develop a bold and ambitious plan, which they have done. We are awaiting some clarification still on spending rules around Prop 28 from the state, which we expect to receive in February, but we're in a good place as we have a plan to move forward once that happens. I want to give a huge thanks to everyone who participated and in particular of the leadership team who took the helm of this work. And I'll turn it over now to Assistant Superintendent Knavel and the awesome lead team. Thank you, Dr. Waddell. And thank you to President Fairchild and Board of Trustees and student board member. Um, we'd like to begin our presentation by sharing a video by one of our Sutter Music students, Finley White. So if I could ask our IT team to play that for us. Hello, my name is Finley White and I go to Sutter Elementary. I'm in room 20 and Mr. Moore is my music teacher. To start off, let's talk about why music is important. Music is important because it brings people together like a community. For example, when I was in my music class, everybody in it helped set things up and take them apart. Second of all, let's talk about why music is important to me. Music is important to me because it can express different cultures and emotion. For example, Mexican music can represent a Mexican culture, and Italian music can represent an Italian culture. Also, if someone is sad, they can use music, play a sad tune to represent that they're sad. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Finley. Thank you. Okay, so um, that kind of sums it up for us. But presenting to you tonight is our amazing leadership team from our Strategic Arts Committee. They are here to share the committee's work over the last several months and to present to you the SCUSD Strategic Arts Plan. I will turn it over to our team as they introduce themselves and we will get started. Hello, my name is Sharon Freeman. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Sharon Freeman. I'm Vice Principal of Activities at Santa Clara High School. 
my name is Tim. Uh, my name is Tim Bacon. I am the music teacher at Kathleen McDonald High School, and I also serve Montague and Agnew Elementary Schools. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Moore. I'm one of the elementary music team through Educational Services. I'm at Milliken, Sutter, and at Bracker. Hello, my name is Heather Morton, and I am the visual art teacher, one of the visual art teachers at Wilcox High School. As you can see from our adorable video, the arts teach so much more than tempo, painting, expression. Throughout this video, or throughout this presentation, you will see art samples from our students, such as these. The arts create opportunities for our students to communicate, whether it be about their culture or life experiences, or learning about their own voice and giving them an opportunity to explore all creative uh, possibilities. Their arts allow for community engagement and an opportunity for students to share their talent and knowledge. In this presentation, you will hear about the process of how many voices came together to create our plan, a process that was also followed in developing the mission and vision. Innovation and the celebration of a wide representation of our students were key focus areas for the strategic arts plan. Establishing a plan to create a standard of practice for the arts in all levels was a necessity for our district. The drive to develop an arts plan came when the state announced arts fundings for uh, coming soon for our school districts. Dr. Waddell sent out a message for all arts teachers to participate in the first ever creation of the strategic arts plan and everyone answered the call. Starting in November 2023 or 2022, we were fortunate enough to have Armelin Della O and Chris Alexander, two facilitators from the California Arts Project, guide our development, which was chaired by Dr. Waddell and Mrs. Knavel. And over 40 educators joined in the professional development workdays. Educators included single subject visual art, music, theater, and digital arts teachers as well as our elementary classroom teachers and the leadership team you see here. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Tim to share our development process. Thank you. Here's some pictures from our initial meeting in January. Members were invited to join the leadership team, which helped to build agendas and set goals for each of the subsequent meetings in spring 2023. Prior to the first committee meeting, an inventory of arts programming was collected about which, about which arts courses and programs were being offered at each of the sites. As the committee met and discussed the inventory, we found inconsistencies from site to site, which helped the team focus on what needed to be addressed in the plan. In November, all arts teachers were invited to a Zoom meeting to announce the start of the plan and see who would like to participate. In January, secondary arts teachers and elementary music teachers met in person at McDonald to begin brainstorming what we wanted our plan to look like. The elementary arts educators and admin had their initial meeting in February. In each meeting, we created small groups that focused on addressing the elements of the plan, which we will share momentarily. We gathered, we gathered together again in March to continue adding and refining the details in each of the five areas of the plan. Each of the focus groups met separately online with Armel and Della O to continue hammering details out, meeting at least twice before our last in-person meeting in June. This process continued in a variety of online meetings with the leadership team and a final in-person meeting with the arts educators and administrators in June. And now I'd like to hand it over to Sharon. All of our work is grounded in chapter nine of the California Arts Education Framework. As Tim discussed, we inventoried our school sites to find commonalities as well as gaps in the arts education. 
And um, our district music programs were already working hard to inventory their instruments, their performances. And so we wanted to capture that knowledge in the room and look at the music programming timeline and if this could be utilized with other art departments as well. These are some fantastic Santa Clara High School music students that you see there. Uh, we also needed to make sure that we were um, connected to the students, not just to the adults on our campuses. So the uh, superintendent student council and the, um, the student senate, uh, Ms. Uh, DeRico and also Dr. Waddell uh, brought this uh, this plan to these student groups. The student, the superintendent student council is made up of all of the leadership students on the secondary campuses. And now I'll turn it over to Stephen. Given Dr. Waddell's uh, direction and inspiration to us to dream big and with Armelin de la O's guidance to make sure that sky was the limit, we all were brainstorming. Anything was on the table, anything you could possibly imagine. From these uh, original brainstormed ideas, we were asked uh, individually to select three of our most important ideas, at which time we put them on the board in kind of random order with nothing happening necessarily. Then we were starting to group like ideas, but as you can see here, I'm not sure if you can see there's like triangles and infinity symbols. We didn't want to call anything anything because we wanted to make sure that we were still leaving everything very open. But after this, we started naming the groups, things like curriculum or facilities. And after we named the groups, what we uh, the five main areas, which I'll go over in just a, main, in a minute here, the, the participants decided which of these five areas they decided was the most important to them. And then the groups started to become um, formed that we're gonna be working on each of these areas together. A little bit about the way the process worked. And then in the lower right or lower left, I can do this. Uh, that's Heather there from our team. After the final sessions with the leadership team, Dr. Waddell, Mrs. Knavel, Ms. Storico, and our, um, our Santa Clara uh, Office of Education Arts Coordinator, Sofia Vojas, worked to put the plan together in this document that can be shared with our families, staff, and the community at large. Now to show you our five focus areas of, of our plan. Curriculum and instruction facilities and resources, leadership and qualified personnel, professional learning and student outcomes. The group that I was leading was the curriculum and instruction. And one of the things that was most interesting to me were that we were making sure that this was gonna be a comprehensive district-wide program where we were to start with the little kids, even before the kindergartners. So we're really looking at the way arts are gonna be explored by every single kid that comes through the district, no matter what their age or what their ability is. We're gonna make sure that we're gonna have a comprehensive scope and sequence, which is this roadmap in our second point here, making sure that we address different levels and different abilities. In addition, we're gonna be looking at trying to figure out how to make sure our scheduling works, making sure that maybe um, conflicts are not going to be things that are going to be limiting the possibilities of making sure that the arts reach all of our students. And then making sure that at the end, there's some kind of real world uh, experience for the kids, something that they can be proud of, something that really gives them the opportunity to um, have their creativity come forward. Now back to Sharon. Next up is facilities and resources. We all know that the educators in the room are very important, but the room is just as important as well. 
Um, but having a dedicated space for the arts at each school site is a need that the educators during this process of creating the strategic arts plan spoke to while they were meeting. Uh, the group plans to assess uh, what current school sites have and what resources are available and work with the facilities department to bridge in, uh, inequities and in space availability, as well as assess the budgets uh, already allotted to the arts at sites and what additional resources can be harnessed there. The resounding request from the arts educator was the need to hire a qualified arts coordinator at the district level. The educators in the classroom wanted a direct contact to the district office and someone with the knowledge base, not just of curriculum and of student needs, but also district level knowledge, for example, facilities and budget work. Um, along with hiring at the district level, the teams want to hire qualified arts instructors for all five disciplines that so that there can be equity at all school sites with arts instruction. All right, the, the group that I was a part of was professional learning. Uh, it was important to our teachers that they were prepared to teach all the disciplines through dedicated professional learning and to continuously improve our teaching practices. It is important for us to collaborate with each other to stay consistent and up to date with arts instruction. Edit. The student opportunities section of our plan focuses on establishing student a student opportunities team that would include the arts coordinator and arts educators to develop a calendar of events that happen both in the district and then within the community so that we can create opportunities to showcase our student work. So as you heard from our leadership team and from Dr. Waddell, we were given the charge to dream big. This is a very robust plan and one that will guide us as we strengthen our arts programs and one that we will revisit and revise as we begin the implementation. We know that we will see things in there that we need to move different places or that um, need to be moved up or down the, the timeline. Um, it was of utmost importance though to the team that there be equitable arts access and opportunities across all of our schools and for all of our students and a district-wide comprehensive approach to that. Um, as it's stated in our plan, the arts contribute to holistic education by fostering a range of skills, qualities, and perspectives that prepare students for their academic pursuits and their lives as engaged, empathetic, and creative individuals, which aligns perfectly with our core values. So lastly, I'd like to talk about um, one of the first tasks that we'll have to do as a strategic arts, with our strategic arts plan. We will need to build a monitoring process for our plan and also to gather an arts advisory committee that spans across our community, all of our educational partners, meaning students, families, teachers, paraeducators, administrators. And this will help us to measure our progress and be in a cycle of continuous improvement, enabling us to focus on making adjustments and adaptations as we implement the plan over the next several years. And you have our hot off the press, first print we know. Um, thank you, Mrs. Dorico, for, for helping us out with this. We know now that we've seen it in print, we're gonna make a few like adjustments, but I'm very proud of this version. This is the link to the um, arts plan on our website. So it's just as nice to look at online as it is in here, but all of the other, if you were part of the arts committee, can you just put your hand up, please? So we have a few more representatives here that have been come to support, so thank you. I have plans for you, so don't leave without grabbing one. And now we can take questions. Thank you so much for this 
amazing vision. I'm very excited. Um, we will start with just one round of comments, hopefully, from the board. And then if there's anyone in the audience that would like to make some comments, we can go there. Um, do I? Oh, Trustee Ratterman, will I have you go first? First, enormous compliments. Uh, just ecstatic about the fact that we're spending this type of effort, this type of focus on our arts programs. I think it's long overdue and I really appreciate what you've done. I knew that uh, we have an, an eminent author in our midst, uh, the art of everything uh, that, that Gary Waddell uh, did. And it had to do with, uh, I haven't quite finished reading it, but it had to do with, you know, making sure arts are in the forefront. Um, the I did have a question along the lines of, and I don't want any of these questions to look as, as criticism, they're not. Um, but if we look at focus area two, which has to do with resources and resources, I'm particularly interested in, because that's an area where the board can directly have an effect. Um, I noticed out on donors choose that one of our uh, music teachers is trying to buy cellos. And I know we put an enormous amount of money in uh, several million dollars into buying musical equipment because this board believes in that particular type of education. So I was a little curious about that and I wanted to know. You know, I, when I look at the action steps you've got under there, the, it's gather current budget available funds for arts, subject area, go, grade, course level, et cetera. But what I didn't see in there was a process to say, we don't have enough resources. Where, how would you come back to this board and say, hey, okay, look, we've got the resources, we've looked at it, we don't have enough to do the job. It's up to you, board, to decide whether or not you'll fund the, the, the necessary gap there. And I'd like to see that as part of the process. So maybe you can have some comments. What I can tell you is that we do have some resources for instruments. Um, if you, you might not recall, but several years ago, you did put a very large chunk of money toward instruments for elementary. That was when we reinstated the elementary program. Um, that's been several years and we have been able to manage um, keeping those uh, repaired and revitalized as we go. They do have a life. We are starting to think about that. That will be part of the plan just to think about that. I do know also that we have, um, that the secondary sites are given uh, department budgets, but we also have a music budget at the district level that we help to use, we help, we use to help buy instruments. For instance, to start with all of our recorders and recording books and the bells that the elementary have in third grade are all um, repurchased re, re every year out of the district office music budget, as well as I know we just did, oh, I don't have any of the middle school music teachers, but two middle school are receiving more instruments out of that fund. So as the needs arise, we bring them. We don't actually often see donors choose to see who's asking for things, but I will look into that because perhaps that person just didn't know they could reach out. Yeah, and I want to be careful because this, this is a teacher who is going above and beyond to try to take care of his kids, make sure he has what yes. he needs. So that's a real positive. Yes. I just want to know why we're not buying it for him. That's yes. All. Trustee yes. Redderman, if I, if I might add also, you know, we, we have, um, as we think about this plan, there are some, some funding sources we have, there was the uh, arts, music and instructional materials block grant, which was actually reduced this year and, and has many other purposes as well. The prop 28 funds we know are forthcoming. There's a lot of, we're, we're still waiting for clarity on, and we won't get those until the spring. Um, but we know this plan is really, as we said, a bold and ambitious plan. It's more than we can do in any one year, certainly. So the pace at which we implement might prompt us to come back and, and ask for, for more support for the, for the, uh, to implement it more quickly. Well, thank you. And, and the key point I wanted to make is I'd like to make sure that the plan itself has a mechanism for asking for that support. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Uh, Mr. Shield. Yeah, I also wanted to echo something that um, Kathy talked about also, and that is we're taking some practices that we typically use on the business services side, like vehicle replacement schedules and technology replacement cycles. I talked to Kathy, we're going to expand that logic and that best practice to also our instruments. So do a detailed inventory, estimate a useful life of that. So that way we can go ahead and set money aside when we think we're going to need to do that replacement. So we're taking those business practices that we are also developing in other areas and also going to do it on the instrument side as well. So that way we can be forward thinking about that. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Shield. Trustee Canova and then Trustee Gonzalez. No, this is very, very robust, exciting. I, I agree with Andy. We have to make sure that this is, as you stated, um, equally available across the district. You know, in the past, we've had situations where over the years where maybe one particular school site might be excelling and then others would be kind of a desert. And, and we don't want that. We want this district wide. We as a board uh, with the first string have to make sure that this is funded properly. You know, we were so focused on technology and keeping up with technology. Can't we do that with instruments? Can't we do that with the arts? I think we can. Um, many people know I love career tech. And the reason I love career tech is that student that struggles with math at high school, when they find a career that they're interested in, it could be carpentry, who knows what, but all of a sudden the math makes sense. They make these connections and now they're excelling in math because now it's practical. Music does the same thing. I mean, uh, Sting, the musician, he makes a very powerful argument where um, mathematics and music are very much tethered to each other. So that student that might be bored to tears with algebra in the classroom through arts can fall in love with math in a very different way. And so I'm excited. Um, it's a beautiful plan, but let's make sure that it has the fuel that it needs to be effective. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. So one of the questions that I was going to have is, can we have something like we do with technology with this? So I'm glad we're already thinking about that and, uh, you know, are going to be implementing some, some program like that. Um, and I guess it's resources as we look across the district and, and look at how we can uh, manage, uh, whether it's rooms, whether it's uh, storage, and other things that, that sometimes these instruments require. And we definitely work to make sure that, you know, it, it is equitable across the district, whether it's, you know, in Alviso or, or on, on the south side of the Bayshore, that across the district that we basically have the opportunities for our students as, uh, as, it, as it's needed to, to make sure that they have the, uh, this art, music, you know, uh, opportunities that, that uh, we can offer right. And the uh, last thing I was going to mention is like, I'm not sure who's responsible for the corridor. And we have a, a lot of times it's art, sometimes it's pictures, but um, definitely uh, it's something that I know when we come to the boardroom, it's always nice to see that out there. And, you know, the more opportunities that we have to, to, to show this and showcase this to not only us, but the community, I think is important. And um, it's, I think it's vital for our students and, uh, Definitely needed. So thank you for, for your work and uh, the report is really fantastic. Thank you. I do want to add that I know music sort of falls in the front because instruments are big and very out there, but there are five disciplines and, um, you know, our, our visual arts teachers have some, um, you know, we want to make sure that they have everything they need for their programs, but we also have theater and many opportunities to build our theater programs at a younger age which would then build our high school theater programs. We have the digital arts, which is, a, we have a teeny bit going on, which really connects with CTE. So we need to think about that as well. And then I am forgetting dance, dance, which we don't have at all, which is why I was forgetting. We have dance teams, but not within the realm of an arts curriculum, right? So that's the one that we we are really wanting to make sure that we're doing a balance of all five. So we will come back to you again. And as we sort of figure things out and, and plan to go forward. Thank you. Trustee Muirhead. Thank you all for the work you've put in on this. Such a, um, it, it's something that isn't really thought of every day. Um, we, and we are spending a lot of time on math right now and a lot of time on literacy and, and super important, but we need to have well-rounded kids and there are kids where this is the spark that, you know, it's not just athletics that keeps them in school, right? There's lots of things that keep kids in school. The arts is one of them. And um, I loved it when my kids did theater and they did music and they did art in, in schools, digital art, all those things. Um, it was just, I'm so glad that they had the opportunity and I want to make sure that all of our kids have the, that opportunity. Um, and this, I know this is just a plan, but um, I'm wondering if anyone has an idea of how this is going to um, roll out. How are you going to need funding? You, you've got some new positions in here and um, other things that are going to take funding. So so is there a thought about how, how it's going to roll out? Yes. Um, so the the this leadership team that you see is kind of serving as our monitoring and implementation team as well. 
Um, we are waiting. Uh, we're being cautious at the advice of the state until there, there are more clear rules around Prop 28 spending because there are um, dire penalties for, for uh, using it incorrectly, but, they're, but they're, the rules around how to use it are not clear. So we, uh, we are moving ahead at this time only with, we want to be certain that we're um, supplementing, not supplanting. So we are adding a, an arts TOSA position. And that's kind of our first step that we're taking this year. And we know that when those Prop 28 funds go into effect, 80% of them uh, must be spent on personnel and 20% can be spent on the other kinds of things that we've been discussing. Um, so we'll be looking at, at those kinds of plans and how we can leverage resources to, to expand the program. Great. And do we know when that Prop 28 money is going to uh, be? We're expecting it in February. We should find out our uh, adjusted allocation in October, and then the first allocation will come in February. And we have three years to spend the the funds from the time they're received. So, so we're just wanting to be thoughtful, intentional. But we have a we have a map. We just have to get started down the road. But we might see some of these in next year's budget. Yes, and and we might, and and some of these things. I hope that we'll begin to take first steps when we receive the Prop Twenty Eight funds. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Ryan and then Trustee Lieberman. Uh, just again, want to echo all the thanks for the committee and all the work. Um, very exciting to see the plan. I was thinking about how when my middle son was in, I think, first or second grade, the teacher was trying to raise funds to have some musical instruments in the classroom. And I'm really excited that we can do much more today and, and bring that to um uh, to the kids in all grades. And, and I'm happy that you mentioned dance too. We were actually just talking about that as a family about different experiences that we've had having, I think dance mostly in PE, but um, uh, what exposure we have of that in, in uh, we were just talking about that as a family. So really excited to see the work, glad to support it and, and can't, can't wait to see next steps and, and how it progresses. Thank you. Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President um, Fairchild. Um, this is fantastic. Um, as the parent of a child that spends every free waking moment she has drawing. Um, I, this, and Miss Morton is her teacher. So, um, <laughs> um, this is, I love this so much. Um, and, um, as an adult who still has PTSD from doing, um, square dancing in fourth grade, I am so excited that, um, we will are looking into having actual dance classes in schools because square dancing is no. um and um also one of the things that i would love to see also and i don't know miss knable you mentioned drama um i know middle schoolers who would love it if we had a drama program where they could put on productions um you know my daughter attends peterson there's a drama club but it's hit or miss in terms of if there's an advisor for it, how often they meet, is the show actually going to happen? Um, it takes a lot um, because it's it's volunteer, it's a club. Um, so I would love to see this open up that opportunity for middle schoolers to be able to put on a production and learn about what it takes to do that. Um, so hopefully we can we can get there. But this is fabulous. Thank you so much for it. Well, that the year you've gotten unanimous <laughs> kudos. Yay. Uh, very, very excited about this. I have to admit that when I moved to this, I first started working for this district, I was actually surprised by the what I consider to be the lack of arts. And no one's mentioned choir. We have some small choirs here, but when I entered middle school, you either it was required, you either took choir or you took band or orchestra. You had to take an, an art class like that. And then you also had to take the drawing class. And I think that was in eighth grade. I mean, it was just part of the curriculum, but they had more periods in the day, they had seven. Um, and so that's where my question comes because one of the concerns I have with, as everyone's mentioned, the technology focus of this area, is how do we keep kids in art classes when they get to high school? And if this has been discussed, I would love to know your thoughts. Yeah, 
investigative scheduling is one of the things that we definitely want to look at and making sure that when we're talking about the word curriculum, it's a running through from beginning to end. I mean, it's like the running through of a stream. If it gets dammed at like at, at sixth grade because they have to do a certain kind of curricular activity that then stops, you know, an art project or an art program or a dance program or a theater program or a music program, then we frequently hear as educators, oh, well, I'll take it back up again in seventh grade. And this very frequently does not happen because then other interests then will take over. So trying to make sure that when we say comprehensive, that it's going to be able to be for any kid. And when we say that it's going to be uh, TK through 12, that we're looking at like, what are the possibilities? Like perhaps having more periods in the day or perhaps using zero periods, if that's the best way of doing it. And everything's on the table right now. So we're making sure that those kinds of, those kinds of concerns are going to be addressed. One of the things I've I've thought about just looking at how I, I'm not sure which teacher is asking for the cellos, but I do know that we have 22 more students this year in band than we did last year in our band orchestra at Cabrillo. We're up to 182. And what not that, of course, we would love everyone to do a musical instrument, but it'd be wonderful if we had a choir there you know, which can have so many more students. We see the interest is there in the musical arts, but I, I'm really glad we're going to start looking at this because there are some, some definite gaps in our curriculum. And I, and I just, my, the, my one piece is that scheduling piece at the high school, especially um, how can we allow for our students who have that interest to still be able to fulfill those A to G quiet requirements and um, feed their souls with art. I mean, I just hope we can figure that out. And that's one of the things I think is so critical about this plan. Just echoing again what Ms. Knavel said, uh, Mrs. Knavel, excuse me, uh, said about making sure that we're really looking at all the areas of art, not just music. And I have to be careful because I'm the music teacher. So I'm very much on that side. I can tell you something that may be news to you. Um, it was news to us. Though we are looking at uh, declining enrollment through district wide, we are looking at increased enrollment in the music program. And so when maybe we might be looking at a donor's choose because it's like, hey, I need some cellos. What am I going to do? Sometimes it's quickly trying to solve a problem that we didn't even know was going to happen to start with. So music is doing very nicely, but we're also trying to make sure that this is a comprehensive arts program that we are looking at, not just music, but in theater, dance, visual arts, and in um, and in visual art, uh, visual arts and choir. Yeah, and and I know that I know both of my children at at Cabrillo feel like they have to choose. They they want to be in the art class but then they would have to let go of their music and band. And, and they, they just, it would be great if we could figure something out there. Uh, coming from the high school, I do know that uh, seven periods are allowed. Uh, it's, it's infrequent just because of FTEs. So that's something that we're looking at, like looking at credential inventories, looking at what we could do to um, allow those students to be able to do all of the things that they that they want without it having to be just after school because a lot of times they also want to do sports or whatever it might be so um it may it's it's not it's not black and white because every every kid is going to be a little a little different on what they need so we'll 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 roll with it as we can fabulous thank you so much um we'll now go out to the room and to the zoom to see if we have any comments do we i did not receive any slips if anyone would like to comment you could just come to the front do we have any hands raised do we have anyone in the room well thank you so much this was just delightful and i'm so excited i think we need to give them another little round of applause We are now to agenda item C1, which is public comment on closed session agenda items. Again, I have no slips. I, if, if anyone in the room or Zoom would like to comment, now's the time. Okay, I'm closing public comment on closed session agenda items. With the board will now go into closed session. In closed session, we'll discuss.
discuss item D.1, consideration of the waiver of administrative hearing and stipulated expulsion agreement regarding student 0914238.1. D2, public employee appointment government codes section 549576, management vice principal Cabrillo Middle School. D3, public employee discipline dismissal release. D4, conference with labor negotiators, agency representatives Gary Waddell, Jose Gonzalez, and Mark Schill, employee organizations UTSC, CSEA, AFT, unrepresented employees, and management. And D5, conference with legal counsel, significant, significant exposure to litigation, two cases. We anticipate that we will be in closed session for about an hour. We will resume open session um, at somewhere between 6.50 and 7 o'clock. Thank you so much.
the board has returned from closed session. We will resume open session with the introduction of our interpreter. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams. Angélica Benítez y yo tenemos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta reunión, eh, esta sesión en español, oprima el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio en inglés. Thank you. Thank you. I will now read out the report from closed session. For item D1, the Board of Trustees with a motion by Board Member Ratterman and seconded by Board Member Gonzalez to accept the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel to approve the stipulated expulsion agreement with suspended for enforcement. The Board voted 7-0 to zero to approve student 091423A.1 be placed at New Valley High School on a one semester rehabilitation con contract. For item D2, the board received information. For item D3, the board received information. For item D4, the board received information. And for item D5, the board received information. We will now have a report from our superintendent. Thank you, President Fairchild. Um, we, uh, we've been very busy with back to school nights as, uh, uh, as at the, from the start of this year, and we've about wrapped them up. There's just been such great energy and enthusiasm around our sites and a very positive opening to the year. Uh, I also had the uh, great good fortune to attend the District Council PTA meeting on Monday. Just wanted to give huge thanks to our PTA leadership across the district who are doing really phenomenal work and making lots of opportunities available to our, for our students. Our uh, DLT steering committee has a new moniker. Uh, we're now calling ourselves the Labor and Management Partnership Steering Committee, or LAMPS. Um, we're lighting the way. <laughs> we, uh, we want to um, really lean in on our partnership and as we uh, chart a course for the district. This expanded team that we've added a few members to guides the work of our DLT, supports site leadership teams, and convenes as a management union leadership partnership to roll up our sleeves and work in concert to make our district the truly awesome place it is for students and staff alike. Our Math Pathways Committee has started its community engagement sessions, which will continue through the end of the month. Last week, the committee presented its proposal, answered questions, and heard input from feedback and feedback from staff in two sessions, Bookser and Peterson. There are more sessions forthcoming. In addition, the committee also held a session with SCUSD Student Senate, uh, and they're continuing to get together input, and we anticipate bringing a proposal back to you in November. Uh, we're looking forward to the Santa Clara Parade of Champions on Saturday, October 7th, and I'm looking forward to being a guest um, and certainly look forward to those of you who can join me as well as cabinet in the parade and, uh, and to our entire community to attend as spectators. Uh, we have several entries in the parade from schools and programs across the district, and we hope to see the community out there celebrating with us that Santa Clara Pride. In addition to visiting school sites, uh, I've had the great good fortune to visit some of our uh, district departments and divisions and greet staff and hear about their work. So far, I've been able to visit transportation, nutrition services, and human resources. Next up is maintenance and operations. We are blessed with some truly amazing individuals who make our district the special place that it is, and it, uh, it's been a delight to connect with them uh, on these visits. Lastly, I just want to call out the awesome teachers and paraeducators across our district. While I, of course, can't mention everyone here, I'm just constantly amazed and inspired by the work, the quality of the work, the commitment to students that I see across our district, and it makes it a delight to, to work alongside them. And that concludes my comments. Thank you so much. Next, we are delighted to have our own student trustee give our student senate report. 
So I will now turn the time over to Luis Valdez. Thank you very much. Hello board and everyone in attendance. Today we will be sharing a little bit about what is happening at MEX as this presentation will be introducing just a little bit of a snapshot into the day in the life of the events and the students at MEX. Next slide. Perfect. So as a quick introduction, my name is Luis. I represent MEX as the student senator. Some quick information about MEX is that the students get out at 12 p.m. every single day, and not all students' schedules do look similar. This is just some background information for everyone, uh, in case it may have been forgotten. But the days often tend to change due to college classes. So some examples may be that some students may not have any college classes after high school, and they go to straight home at 12 p.m., or there may be some students that have classes that range from perhaps 1240 to 205, or maybe 6 to 9 p.m. So yeah, and typically events are held after school, and mostly on Fridays, as classes are not often had on Fridays. So now we will move on to some of the current events that MEX has had from this school year of 2023 to 2024 from the beginning of the school year to the present. So we did have our welcome back day on the 11th. Our welcome back day was when we were able to bring lots of candy, lots of treats for these students. On top of that, we also did have this big picture frame where students were able to take pictures and it was quite fun. We got a pretty good turnout and everyone did seem to enjoy their candies and whatnot. On top of that, we had a very successful back to school night in which lots of parents were able to be introduced to their teachers and what is happening within MEX. And it was pretty nice. Everyone had a great time. Students came out and supported as student ambassadors. And parents also were delighted to see what their students were up to within each class. Yesterday, we had our Pizza My Heart fundraiser, which is one of many that we plan to have. On top of that, we had class council elections and we did get our results. So that is great for all the new people joining us in leadership. And soon enough, we will have a fall leader, a, a fall club day in which all of our clubs will be introduced. Some of the upcoming events that we have for MEX are on October 20th, we are planning a volunteer opportunity at Second Harvest Food Bank of Silicon Valley here on First Street in San Jose. This is an excellent opportunity. I personally volunteer there all the time. Wonderful staff, and it is a great way of getting three community service hours. What you typically do there is you help sort food and you put it into boxes and it's quite fun, especially when you're able to do it with friends. We also will be having our first spirit, wing, uh, first spirit week on October 30th through November 4th. And although the events are still undecided, this is one of our plans as last year we had excellent participation from students and everyone did seem to have a great time. For Thanksgiving, as one of the events that we'll have for fundraising, we will be doing a Thanksgiving pie potluck and bake sale. So students will be encouraged to bake their own pies, and we will be baking some ourselves, and we will be able to fundraise that way. In the past, we have had bake sales in terms of cookies, brownies, and other sweets, and that has been very successful for fundraising, and students love being able to share a sweet treat together with their friends. Lastly, we will be having a winter breakfast, which is a tradition now at MEX. So towards December, around the last day of school, for before the break gets out, we have a winter breakfast. And that's basically where we spend the majority of the day. And the entire school comes together. We, have, we make eggs, bacon, sausages, pancakes, and we just enjoy as an entirety of the school. So it is quite an enjoyable thing, and it definitely brings the community together quite a lot. So in the near future. So for the upcoming things past those events, we definitely hope to have an enjoyable semester where people are able to feel very connected within their school. And we are able to not only bring in new social experiences for old students, but also the new upcoming freshmen and the freshmen that are currently here. And we want to definitely make everyone feel socially welcomed and to enjoy their semester at MEX. 
And with that, conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. We will now have a report from our union presidents. Good evening, Dr. Waddell, President Fairchild, <clears throat> trustees, and student Senator Valdez. Ms. Burrell, don't want to forget her. Um, how did you enjoy your extra day off on September the 4th? Were you able to spend time with family and friends, enjoy outdoor activities, binge watch your favorite TV shows, throw some shrimp on the Barbie, or just rest and relax? However you spent that day, thank your unions for Labor Day, a day set aside to recognize and honor the contributions and of laborers across our country. And no one exemplifies the ethic of hard work and dedication more than classified employees the backbone of our public schools. I enjoyed my Labor Day very much. I took a nap. Speaking of hard work and dedication, I wish to mention that we still have too many unfilled paraeducator positions. These wonderful people are the heart and soul of special education, yet many leave and many hesitate to take on this role because it is very challenging and not appreciated enough or recognized by appropriate compensation. So please, when you go into our schools, go out of your way to find, thank, and encourage our paraeducators. And thank you for recognizing them earlier in your report, Dr. Waddell. We had our first <clears throat> negotiations meeting with the district last Friday, and we scheduled four more by December. We have many topics to address. You saw our initial proposal and much that is of mutual interest. So um, it's not going to be a quick process, but one that will result in why optimistically think will be a satisfactory outcome for all. We had to reschedule our executive board planning day to October 16th. As I mentioned in a previous report, the purpose of this is to set goals and plans to strengthen our chapter, increase involvement, and investigate ways to provide professional support and growth opportunities for our members. I'll update you when there is more to share. I'm excited to inform you that CSE Chapter 350 is hosting a two-day workshop for the executive board, our stewards, members who participate in the district leadership team, as well as site leadership teams and district committees. The topic of this two-day retreat is equip, empower, and educate. The purpose is to build confidence, strengthen skills, and develop recognition of the importance of voicing our perspective during essential collaborative conversations. The date has not yet been finalized. David Torres, HR Director for Classified and I have been making our annual rounds of meetings with classified employees in all schools and departments. Mr. Torres gives them information on ways HR can support them, um, items in our contract that are beneficial that they can get support from HR for, and who they can connect with. And I discuss how the union supplements that support and often works with management to improve their options. CSEA leadership is collaborating and meeting very often, I might add, with district management and leadership from our fellow unions to expand and deepen the focus, the goals, and the plans to realize our district priorities. We have been planning and organizing district leadership meetings and presentations, as well as designing the site leadership team training that are scheduled trainings that are scheduled throughout the year. And I would like to thank Mr. Stam for spearheading a lot of these things. I know he he also agrees with me. We're in a lot of meetings. <laughs> so I will end with my usual giants update. Things are looking better, but I am holding back on getting too excited about our chances at a wild card spot in the playoffs. This concludes my report. Have a wonderful evening. Not yet, just a second. Thank you very much. Good evening, President Fairchild, Dr. Waddell, Student Trustee Valdez, and the Board of Trustees. I'm pleased to share that UTSC had our first site rep council meeting of the school year just a few weeks ago. We had a new batch of site reps and just last night we held our first site rep training of the year. 
At our first meeting, our site rep council approved a UTSC community schools resolution, a copy of which was provided to you this evening. In our resolution, UTSC commits to an ongoing partnership with the district to successfully implement the community schools program. We are hopeful that the school district will adopt a similar resolution, publicly committing to a shared decision-making model with all staff, families, and with our community. Now the, now the pictures, thank you. I'd only like to share a few pictures with you from our recent participation at the San Jose Pride Parade. UTSC had about 20 teachers, spouses, partners, and children walk behind our new banner. The parade occur occurred on a warm day in San Jose, one that was full of laughter and goodwill. It was heartwarming. This picture is great. This is one of um, Miss Hayes's students screaming at her, Mrs. Hayes. It was great. It was, a, it was heartwarming to hear our community scream, we love our teachers as we walk down the parade route. Thank you very much. In support of our goal this year to build relationships with the community we serve, UTSC will be participating in the Coastal Cleanup Day scheduled for next Saturday, September 23rd. I hope to have photos from that event to share at our next school board meeting. Thank you for those slides. About 10 years ago, California enacted a set of education codes that require schools to portray accurately and equitably cultural and racial diversity and to avoid gender, gender stereotypes. These laws can be found primarily in Ed Code Section 50501, 60040, and 60044. They are an interesting read, they were an interesting read for me, and I recommend folks take the opportunity to carefully review them. Without reserve, UTSC fully supports our students' rights to access all academic freedoms afforded to them. As teachers, we are committed to supporting the growth and development of the whole child, regardless of their identification or any category they fall into that could limit their opportunities. Our students are wonderfully complex, rich with diversity, learning how to step into their own truth without fear or trepidation. We know that SCUSD embraces their academic freedoms and that you have our teachers' backs when helping our students achieve as much growth as possible. And yet in our surrounding communities, in our very own community, outside groups spew rhetoric and misleading language to confuse our families and our students. While purporting to be truth tellers, these outside groups use secret invitation only training meetings, leafletting, and anonymous social media po posts to put forth their agendas. For crying out loud, they bite. The groups who have no ties whatsoever to our district are making a concerted attempt to fluster our families, our community, and ultimately limit our students' access to a free education guaranteed to them. To our families and our community, we ask that you champion and guard our students' rights. Every student deserves to feel safe and deserves unfettered access to their public education. Every single aspect of our system, teachers and staff, administrators and elected officials, and of course our families, must aggressively protect our rights to teach truth. I leave you tonight with a quote from Nigerian-born British author Ben Okri, who writes, reading is an act of civilization. It's one of the greatest acts of civilization because it takes the free raw material of the mind and builds castles of possibilities. Let's build castles. Thanks very much, have a good night. Uh, Ms. Vaisaki, could you repeat those Ed Code numbers? Sure. Ed Code 50501, Ed Code 60040, Ed Code 60044. Thank you. We will now have our public health update. first public health update as I turn on the air conditioning. Uh, we do have several updates this evening um, in a number of different varying uh, public health areas. County wastewater data. Oops. 
moved on me. County wastewater data shows that COVID rates in the San Jose and Sunnyvale shed areas at medium and high levels, respectively. Public health officials uh, remind the public that it is critical to personnel and public health to keep adults and children up to date with their vaccination schedules, uh, including seasonal vaccinations for flu and COVID. The FDA has approved an updated monovalent uh, or single COVID vaccine targeting the Omicron XBB variant, which is now the most prevalent variant. It is currently under, view, under review with the CDC and is expected to be available to the public as soon as the end of this week. The updated public health strategy has shifted to an, um, to an annual vaccine for the current domain strain aligned to how public health addresses the flu and its annual vaccine. This year's composition of the annual influenza vaccine has been selected and it is available. Public health officials advise that September and October are the best times for people to get vaccinated against the flu. Most healthcare providers and clinics offer the COVID and flu vaccines in the same sitting. The California Department of Public Health has released its 2023-2024 Communicable Diseases Guidance for Schools, which now includes embedded guidance for COVID-19. This replaces any former separate COVID-19 guidance resources. It's important to share that there are no major changes since the guidance for schools and the general public was last updated in March 2023, as governments prepared at that time for the end of the public health emergency related to COVID-19 in May 2023. As a reminder, Cal OSHA has additional guidance for staff, which remains in effect through spring 2025. Our teams are taking this opportunity to review public health guidance and updates to district resources in an effort to ensure continued alignment with public health guidance and consistent practices across the district. As a reminder, the district follows the public health department mitigation strategies recommended for schools, which include the following. It encourages students and staff to stay up to date on all vaccinations, encourage students and staff to stay home and test when sick, Encourage students and require staff to wear masks around others if they have symptoms, test positive, or were exposed to COVID-19. Encourage frequent hand washing and provide access to adequate hygiene supplies. Optimize indoor air quality. Routine daily cleaning with additional sanitation when necessary. Involve the public health department in outbreak response and reporting. Facilitate access to testing by offering free rapid test kits to take home and referrals to other local resources. And finally, to facilitate access to masks by offering free masks to staff and students to use at school and uh, to the community to use at events. Next, um, and this is something that's been in place for uh, since last year, but I thought I'd take the opportunity to share it this evening. Uh, recently, uh, AB 367, which was called the Menstrual Ac Equity Act for All, uh, went into place. And I wanted to share with the board and community that during last school year, we began implementing our district plan to ensure uh, compliance and alignment to that AB, uh, to the bill. Um, our district ensures all schools serving grades six through 12 with free menstrual products and restrooms. Finally, CDPH encourages districts and schools to participate in the International Walk to School Day on October 4th. We're pleased to share that many, if not all, of our elementary schools are participating in Safe Routes to School program events on that day to encourage students to participate in active transportation and learn how to do so safely. We have strong partnerships with our municipal partners to collaborate on our Safe Route programs and events. We look forward to sharing more information with you uh, as the events take place. That concludes this evening's report. Thank you, Mr. Shill. Um, Trustee Raderman. Yeah, I'm just curious, did RSV come up at all in the recommendations to schools or anything else? The RSV virus, the respiratory sick, I can't say it. Uh, I, I believe only in reference to that this is the season for, for respiratory illnesses and that um, ensuring that we're being cautious with using mitigation strategies would would assist both with COVID as well as flu and RSV. And there was a recommendation that we reinforce with schools that uh, the, that they employ mitigation strategies when they have large convenings. Yeah, because it's most, the... it's most severe with youth and, and older. Um, and I just didn't know if there was a policy out there. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to actually ask a question, then we'll go to you. Um, so I'm my question is regarding the decision to start menstrual 
supplies at sixth grade. Um, we do, since the deadline change, we have girls. Girls are starting their periods much younger, third, fourth, fifth grade. Um, I think we ought to. We're, we're currently exploring our ability to implement that as well. Okay. Uh, there was also a bill that was introduced. Um, I'm waiting to hear the status of that, but it would also require that also at the elementary school levels. Uh, but we're currently exploring the possibilities of being able to implement that strategy as well. Okay. I just have to speak for my girls. Thanks. Uh, uh, trustee um, Muirhead and then Trustee Lieberman. Uh, some of these mitigations um, have costs associated with them, such as the free rapid test kits and free masks. Um, are, is the state providing any of these things or giving us any cost recovery on them? So we were able at the uh, near the end of last school year, we ended up uh, acquiring pallets of them under the former program. Uh, we were able to get those th for free through the state programs. Excuse me? Test kits, test kits yes. Um, and we have been deploying those to staff and students uh, when asked. And if any, if we hear that staff are testing positive, we make the test kits available. Uh, in addition to that, I do know that the Santa Clara County Office of Education has been uh, also through their uh, resources, been acquiring additional test kits. And, and when school districts need them, we can reach out to the county office and they will provide those to us as well. So when our supply gets low, that we know that we can go back to the county office. Uh, that's been actually a beneficial strategy because they have... Uh, some significantly larger warehouse spaces available to them than what we currently have available to us. So we are currently working through that. In regards to some other things like masks and things of those nature, we currently have those available in our warehouse and we make those available. And then um, larger things like air quality. Yeah, we, we've things. been continuing all the strategies that we've been doing since the, since the pandemic and returning to school, we've been continuing those strategies. But we're not getting additional funding on that. We are not. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Lieberman. Okay, too many moving parts. Um, with regard to the mitigation strategies, um, I know that we are pushing attendance um, and improved attendance rates. Um, are we tempering that also with um, stay home if you're sick and we don't want to spread germs? Because I'm I'm all for we need our kids in school because it's important to learn. But at the same time, I, I wanna make sure we're not sending a mixed message um, to families uh, about staying home when you're sick, so. Absolutely, thank you for asking that. We are uh, we have these conflicting priorities. We're certainly, one of the measures on the dashboard is chronic absence. And we know, you know when students reach a point of having missed 10, about 10 or so days a year for whatever reason, you know, it's very difficult to, to make that up. That is coupled with, um, with we're still at the tail end of COVID. This is um, a conversation that I participated with a group of superintendents with um, State Board President Linda Darling Hammond. Um, and they're very aware of that tension. Uh, is, in addition to COVID, there are, um, you know, our natural disasters that we've been experiencing, fires and air quality issues all of those sorts of things where there are necessary absences. So uh, our advocacy and our request had been if there's a way to, to help us focus on reducing unnecessary absences, but understanding there will still be necessary absences, but that's um, kind of still in policy discussions at the state. So nothing's changed yet. Okay, thank you so much. We will now have public comment on unagendized items. Before we um, go out to the public, I have two slips. Um, wait, hold on a second. We have some hands raised, two hands raised. Is this about the public health update or about an agendized comment? Okay. Um, could we unmute the person who raised their hand and see if it's uh, about the public health update or an, an agenda? Oh, they put their hand down. Okay. Okay. Um, the board has a, of trustees has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, <clears throat> excuse me, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. Mm -hmm. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible um, 
find reasonable a safe harassment pre workplace for our students and staff. <laughs> In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, a CUSD encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. <laughs> this district seeks public cooperation with this endeavor. The public should note that while we value and want to receive public feedback, board members are prohibited by state law from commenting on, discussing, or taking action on items that are not on the meeting's agenda. The board may refer the commenter to a staff member or other resources for factual information, ask staff to report back to the board at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter, or take action directing staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. When you come to the podium, please turn on the microphone. The green light indicates the microphone is on. You will have two minutes to speak. At the end of two minutes, please return to your seat. If you have additional comments, you may email the board. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. We have two slips from members of the public. Our first speaker will be David Laverne, followed by Eva Ian Jackson. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Laverne of Shoto Dojo. Uh, we've had an after school karate program in the district for the last 16 years. I've spoken to the board several times before, uh, often about fees and availability. The latest and last is a quintupling of fees on top of complete unavailability this summer based on one might. The latest is maintenance fees. Maintenance is, maintenance is a custodial function and we've never actually paid custodial fees just as we've never charged when we have to go in and sweep up and mop up before our class. Well, eventually I found out that it's not a maintenance fee, it's a renovation fund for some time in the future, four times as much as our otherwise fee. Imagine you went to an auto mechanic and he said he'd fix your car for $150, and then you notice he's charging your car $750 instead. Extra fees, he says. And when you say you'll go elsewhere, he says, well, it'll cost you half of that, $375 to leave because he started the paperwork. I think we could all agree to call that mechanic dishonest and that he would deserve that reputation. Well, as we see it, only the numbers are different. Not only have you priced yourself out of the market five times what it used to be, but you've not done your reputation any good either. If we were getting rich at it, we're not especially building back after COVID and no schools over the summer, we'd be losing money. And we'd have lost money all last year at these fees. And I don't know what other after-school programs are going to do with a five-time increase in fees. It's a problem. Mr. Jackson. Good evening. My name is Ian Jackson. I'm an English teacher and union vice president, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about the value of literature and the dangers of banning it. Do you know what Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, George Orwell's 1984, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and Toni Morrison's Belo Beloved all have in common? Beyond being amazing works of literature that feature on countless lists of the great books, beyond being core texts that are taught in high schools across America, beyond tackling important themes such as highlighting systemic racial and socioeconomic prejudice, warning against the dangers of totalitarian government control, showing a dystopian vision of a patriarchal society where women have no rights, and revealing the long-term intergenerational trauma and negative impacts of slavery, all of these books have been banned somewhere and at some point in the United States. And there are certain groups that are looking at our adopted curriculum and looking to have books banned here too. The thing is, books are not just books. Books are ideas. Books are inspiration. Books capture the imagination and show people both what is and what could be. The problem is that sometimes ideas scare people. 
Sometimes ideas threaten people and challenge their view of what is or make them feel uncomfortable about what could be, especially if they themselves have benefited from the way society has always been. Change, even, in it, even if it is good, scares people. But the answer is not to stop ideas. The answer is not to ban books. The answer is to listen to ideas. The answer is to read books. The answer is to consider the world and society from other people's perspectives and not be afraid of them just because they are different from or challenge our own understanding. I am proud that here in Santa Clara, I get to teach books, books that might be banned in less progressive places, books that have relevant themes that allow students to think, and books that have protagonists who represent people of different creeds, colors, and sexual orientations Thank that allow you. students to feel seen. I apologize. I have one more sentence. Let's not ban books. Let's read them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public in the room that wish to speak on an agendized comment? Okay, I'm going to close close public comment in the room and we'll go out to the Zoom. I was just going to make one comment. If there's the one of the gentlemen that spoke had some questions about fees. We can't comment on that, but I was wondering if somebody in the staff, I think they probably already talked to him, but just in case, let's make sure that the information is correct. Yeah, Mr. Shield just indicated they are in communication. Okay, we'll go out to the Zoom. Thank you. For the members of the public attending through the Zoom webinar who would like to speak, please use Zoom's raise hand tool. Public speakers will be called upon in the order that hands were raised. There will be a two minute timer on the screen, similar to the one we have in the boardroom to help you moderate your comments. To ensure everyone has the same amount of speaking time, we will have to move on to the next commenter after two minutes. When your name is called, you will be prompted by Zoom to unmute. Our first commenter is Corey. Um, please unmute. Stand by, we're technical difficulties. There we go, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, good evening, Dr. Waddell and esteemed SCSD board. There are so many times when staff members come before the board to share a concern or worry that they have for completing for a solution to an ongoing problem, this is not that kind of comment. Many times we hear frustration of how construction falls behind schedule or the bonds department hasn't completed or even begun a project that has been on the docket. I wanna come forward with the utmost appreciation and compliments to Larry Adams, Valerie Russell, Trina McCabe, Julie Bennett, and the entire SUSD bonds team for helping to get Westward Elementary up and running for the first week of school. The entire team, along with the facility planning department and Michelle Healy, made sure that our school could open on time with rooms ready and a blacktop area striped and open for the students to get started on with our brand new play yard. First and foremost, it is amazing to be able to see how this team moved an entire 10 portable complex from one end of our yard to the other in such a short time frame. In just eight weeks, this team laid foundation, pulled electrical, sewer, and water lines out to that form, laid concrete, cleared out, and moved 10 portables then set everything up for teachers to be able to enter their doors on August 7th. They even recarpeted, put up blinds, fixed ceiling tiles, and painted the exterior of this preschool complex. Yes, the team worked miracles with 25-year-old portables to give us an amazing preschool area on the side of our campus in a calm grove of trees that looks inviting, clean, and practically brand new. And if that wasn't enough, they also completely restructured our entire outdoor play area, giving Westwood a brand new hardscape and two new play structures. They may not have been quite open for day one, but they opened earlier than expected and the students were beyond thrilled just one week later. The campus looks amazing. The bonds and facility planning teams deserve every compliment for getting things done in such a short window and in such a beautiful way. Westwood is very grateful and we wanna publicly thank them for their work. Gratefully, myself, Corey Gafari and the Westwood Wildcats. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emma Lynn. And 
Good evening. Um, I'm following up on comments shared last month regarding support for our TK students. I'm concerned about both the toileting support and playground issues previously raised, but given time constraints tonight, I'm focused on toileting. Schools have been struggling with the reality that not all TK students are fully independent in the bathroom. This is something that needs to be addressed and it needs to be considered in an inclusive and equitable manner. I'm actively involved in my company's equity work. And one of the things we talk about is the importance of looking at the history of the systems we have in place and who they serve. Systems are usually set up to serve the dominant norm. When we talk about equity, it's not about how we make people conform to our existing systems. It's about how we change systems to meet the needs of the people they're supposed to serve. I bring this up because I've been told that, quote, unless medically documented otherwise, we expect all students to be able to use the bathroom independently without assistance from non-family adults, end quote. Let's consider where this expectation comes from. Until recently, very few four-year-olds could go to school. The dominant norm is that children are potty trained by age five, so schools treated a system that works for the potty trained dominant norm, and those who don't fit are treated as special needs cases with hurdles put in place to helping them. That brings me to another thing we talk about at my work, which is coming from a place of yes, as opposed to simply aiming for compliance. Coming from a place of yes looks like this. A child has an accident and asks for help changing. The school responds by providing staff to help that child. Coming from a place of compliance looks like this. A child has an accident and asks for help changing. It is suggested that parents may need to obtain medical documentation to prove their child is having difficulty and requires assistance. When taking the compliance only approach, somehow a child sitting in the health office in soiled undergarments is not enough to document help is required. I understand the state changed the rules on schools and left it up to you to figure out how to adapt. As a district that believes in equity and inclusion, I ask that you help your schools establish inclusive practices and not just wait until you've been given a state or federal mandate to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We are not allowed to discuss any of the public comments, but I have a feeling that we want to follow up on this. Um, I, that's all I can say. It's not agendized, so I, it's not agendized. Staff can comment with the, can talk with the parent. I will follow up with the parent and we have been in conversation. And will you follow up with the board? Of course. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to consent. Our first item consent is human resources. Do we have a motion to approve? Second. Here. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We now have our consent um, items that are not human resources or other items and minus J5, which we will have immediately after consent. Motion to approve, Rotterman. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Student trustee Jit Valdez. Aye. That passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. Um, we have J5 was pulled by Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President Fairchild. Um, I pulled J5 because I am concerned about um, something I saw on page 36 of the warrant report, and that is the cost uh, um, and the payment to curriculum associates for iReady. Um, I I am concerned about the um, the alignment of the testing to our own curriculum, and if the data that it's providing is actually useful, um, and if the program is being used to fidelity. And my question is that I I'm wondering why, if the publishers of our curriculum that is board approved have tests that we can use to assess student performance, why we're not using that or why we are not creating testing materials that better align with our own board approved curriculum. Um, and I'm concerned, I, I've been hearing from kinder teachers who are trying to get their month old kinder students to do iReady testing, um, that it is nightmarish. Um, 
so I'm, I don't understand why we're putting kinders through iReady testing in September when they've been in school a month. So I would love to have this come to the board um, as an item. I don't care how, um, but I, this is a lot of money to be spending on a program that I'm not fully convinced is appropriate or is doing what we can't do ourselves internally. Um, and so I would like to have some sort of presentation about iReady and um, what our alternatives might be that don't cost $400,000. Okay. Quick point of information. What page is this on? Where? 36. And does it have a line item next to it, warrant number? The last line item on page 36. Thank you very much. The warrant report. Of the warrant report. For $385,000. Um, we cannot just dis really discuss it because it's just about the payment of this amount, but um, Dr. Waddell and I can work on bringing this forward on a future agenda, um, if appropriate. So could we get a motion to approve the warrant report, warrant register and purchase orders for August 2023? Second, Rodderman. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, student trustee. Aye. Uh, that passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. So I wanted some clarity on uh, trustee Lieberman's. Uh, will, are, are we going to be putting this on an agenda or what's happening based on her comments? So based on her comments, Dr. Waddell and I are going to talk about what to do next. Is that okay? Either that's okay or if the board... Let's see how that goes. And then based on that, we can bring it back to the full board if necessary. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now we are to action items from human resources. Um, Dr. Gonzalez is already ready. The first one is action item K1, the appointment of the vice principal of Cabrillo Middle School. I can say we've been anxiously awaiting this. Second, Rodderman. We have a motion and a second. I will turn the time over to Dr. Gonzalez. Good evening, dear board members, Dr. Bodell and Ms. Burrell. It is my pleasure to announce Dr. Jasmina Topolovich. Dr. Topolovich received her BA in Linguistics in Slavic Languages from the University of Belgrade, her teaching credential and master's in Education, Administration and Supervision from San Jose State University, and she received her doctorate from the University of Illinois. Jasmina is coming to Santa Clara Unified School District from San Jose Unified School District, where she has been a teacher and ELD coordinator for the past 15 years. Prior to working as a teacher and ELD coordinator, she was the assistant principal of assessment and student support. Some of Jasmina's responsibilities included being in charge of safety and emergency procedures. She partnered with San Jose PD, San Jose Fire Department, community organizations, and teacher leaders to modernize the school safety plan and redesign the school evacuation plan. She also review and revise school attendance protocols for compliance with district regulations and state audits. And she oversaw the first generation of college outreach program for English language learners at the school. Thank you so much. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes. Any of it opposed? Sorry. That passes seven to zero. We now have item K2, the 2024-2025 Santa Clara Unified School District calendar. We have a motion to approve. Second, Roderman. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Trustee Ryan. Yeah, so um, I, I know I've probably made the same comment several years in a row, um, but um, and but this year in particular, we got a lot of parent feedback right ahead of the school start this year and um, wondering about why it was starting so early um, lots of concern I, I do know the the desire to have uh, finished the first semester before the break um, but but this um, school resume very early and what I have asked for I know that this is a negotiated item um, but we do want community input before it just comes to us as a final product so we do want the uh, I or at least sorry as one trustee I would like us, and I, I've seen this happen in other districts, um, where there is an opportunity for the community to provide input on the calendar um, before it's a final done deal. So 
I'll ask court again that we, um, as we look for the calendar for next year, um, that we bring it for we bring it forward in a draft form early enough so that we can get that community feedback before the calendar is set. So that's my only question or comment. Were there community members on the calendar committee? Uh, we invited uh, some um, parent representatives, uh, but they were not able to attend. We did have uh, teachers at classified staff, certificator staff, participate administrators as well. Uh, I believe we had like three meetings. So we, we had a pretty comprehensive committee uh, to, to review this. Uh, everything really falls um, in um, in the fact that we need to complete finals before the uh, the end of the December break. So when you count the days, um, we should be around uh, 90 days. Uh, we end up always, I mean, it's pretty limited what we can change. Um, yeah, so, but my request has been, um, and there, it sounds like there weren't any community members on the panel get feedback from students, get feedback from the community, bring it to us, or at least bring it to us in a draft. You know, this is coming as an action item. It, we didn't, it didn't come through this different stages of, uh, you know, um, draft or information or whatever, just an opportunity. Because as I said, we got lots of feedback from parents, more than I've ever seen this year, um, concerned about the schedule. I, I know that there's a reason to want to have the, um, it finished before the end of the break, but we don't necessarily know that our students feel the same way or that families feel the same way about it. So I would like to, um, I would like to an opportunity for them to be able to give input um, uh, at some point. And, and that may be that it has to come to the board before it's finalized. Um, as I said, I've seen that happen in other districts. Sometimes it can be a little contentious because families want one thing and staff might want another, but we, you know, we're here to serve the students. We're here to serve the families. We really do need their input on, on the um, the calendar for the district. Thank you. Any other Talks. trustee Gonzalez? I think it's always great to have a uh, community input. But um, as far as uh, your representative on the Metro Ed, there's there's a uh, that that site usually starts about the same time, and most of the districts within that site start within a day or two of each other typically so um as we look at at working with our associations to get this uh calendar set up and hopefully take more maybe public input in, in the future and we also make sure that we we address or look at that schedule so we kind of have our students be you know in the seats at metro ed if they're attending that program as well Thank you. I know it's a collaboration. Um, one of the questions that I had um, that was posed to me was when you looked at the, the things that were considered, I loved seeing that list of, I think it was nine things. The last one was to go into June. So can you explain why that was important? Because sometimes as you see that and you're like, so why is, why is that important? Um, and so I thought I would love to know the answer. And I'm sure to those on the committee, it's like, of course, we need to go into June, but I have no idea why do we need to end in June. So, in order to um, to have our tenth month classified employees to receive uh, a salary in the month of June, we need to have at least one day in June in order to have their uh, you know their salary spread into the the months. So, I was pretty sure that was the reason, but it was a question that was asked, and it and that I think is a very reasonable uh, reason. I mean, I think all of us would like to make sure that everyone gets their 10 months of salary. And so that's, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, there were, for those of you who are um, curious about the, it was nine items, right? That guided the creation of this calendar. It is on the administrative summary on the agenda and it's, it's very um, informative, so. President Any, Churchill. Yes. You know, the uh, the board policy indicates that um, this calendar has to be adopted by January. So, I mean, we still have months. Um, I, I mean, I can I can receive community feedback. Uh, I mean, we're way ahead before it's it's approved. So trustee Ryan would lo would love for that to happen. Do we have direct? No, I, I, no. please don't speak for me. That's not actually okay. what, oh, I would, sorry. I would have said. 
so uh, are you did you want me to do you want him he was so it would be i mean i think it's also important to have dates fixed so that we can do planning so I, i'm not necessarily saying we should postpone this until january to adopt it i'm just saying going forward so as we look for next year and as we're planning for next year maybe we start that even earlier and we maybe we survey families maybe you know rather than having to come to a meeting maybe there's a way to get input i don't i'm not asking that we change the calendar that you're bringing forward to us today but just i do think it's it's important to get that community feedback as i said particularly because we got so much feedback this year on the the early start um, and i do know that there's coordination with others but i also know that there was a good two weeks on different districts around here we're starting so okay so then do we have a motion to approve we already had one oh, we, did. we did okay all right all in favor please say aye. aye aye any opposed okay that passes seven to zero um we now have action item k3 united teachers of santa clara um initial proposal for, proposal for the 23 24 negotiation move to approve second, but, we have a motion and a second any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes seven to zero. Next, we have action item K4, the Santa Clara Unified School District proposal for the 23-24 negotiations with the United Teachers of Santa Clara. Move to approve. We, to ex, oh, receive. Received. Okay. Um, all in favor? I any opposed that passes seven to zero next we have um, action item k5 the updated job descriptions for family child education motion to approve Rodman. we have a motion and a second all in favor please say aye aye, aye. any opposed that passes seven to zero action item k6 was pulled from the agenda action item l one is the resolution 2351 for the 2022 2023 recalculated GAN limit and establish the 2023 2024 GAN limit and appropriations subject to limitations. Move to approve. Second, Rodderman. We have a motion and a second. This will be a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Raderman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. So that passes seven to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next item is action item 22-23, unaudited actual report and presentation from Mr. Shield. Move to, move to receive. Is it a, a move to receive? Move to approve? Move to approve. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Scheel. Good evening. Um, we'll wait for. Uh, so annually, thank you. Uh, annually, we are required to bring to the board uh, our, uh, uh, by no later than September 15th, uh, our unaudited actuals from the preceding fiscal year. And so I will say, first say that we're in compliance since today's one day before September 15th. Um, following the end of the year uh, on June 30th, staff work on closing the books from the prior fiscal year and include any remaining financial transactions, uh, close the books, that results in the unaudited actuals. And then that information is turned over to our auditors that become the basis for the annual audit that will be completed uh, by the statutory deadline in December. Um, after today's meeting, the documents will be sent to the County Office of Education. Uh, so a brief summary as to where we ended up last year for our unaudited actuals on revenues. We finished with a total revenues of 382 uh, million, uh, ju just over 382 million. Uh, the lion's share of those revenues, as is typically the case, was from our property taxes uh, uh, and, and LCFF funding of 299.6 million. I will share that typically um, we do not see the amount of federal and state funding uh, that we have typically received last year. Uh, the reason for that is that um, last year in 22-23 was a significant amount of one-time spending related to one-time COVID funds that were received from both the state and federal governments. I'll have some information for you at the end of the presentation to quantify a little bit of the one-time spending um, and one-time revenues that we received and recognized last year. 
This is always a, a slide that has great interest, and that is a comparison of how did we do on our property tax collection and our revenues compared to the prior year. Uh, I will say that uh, in 21-22, we had total revenues of just under $264 million, and last year we were at $286.1 million. So we saw a total net increase of $22.1 million, and that represents an 8.4% increase over the prior year. And so uh, typically, um, we we see anywhere between that six to eight percent range. Um, it just depends on the economy at that point in time. Um, I will say that while we are happy to hear about that 8.4% increase last year, I would like to remind the trustees that the increase um, from 21-22 to 22-23 was only a 1.3% increase. And so that represents only uh, just under a 5% increase over that two-year period of time. Uh, so a little bit less than what we would typically see over a two-year period of time. Where did our spending go? Last year, we spent $371.3 million, with the lion's share of those uh, being in salaries and benefits for our staff. Not surprising since we are in the people business. And so uh, the lion's share of our resources went to sal salaries and benefits. Total spending of $371.3 million. <coughs> Uh, as you can see here from the summary, uh, total revenue of 382 million, uh, total spending of 371.3 million. Uh, that results in um, revenues exceeding expenses by 10.7 million. Uh, that number seems a little bit large, but I'd like to share that when you break that down between the unrestricted and restricted general funds, um, our unrestricted general fund actually had deficit spending of just under a million dollars at 905,000, and the restricted was 11.6 million. Again, we received a significant amount of one-time revenues last year. We did not spend them all. So those will be restricted and carried over to the current year. And those resources are projected to be spent during the 23-24 school year. Um, so when you see that surplus revenues, that is a little bit misleading when you realize that a sizable amount of that um, is actually attributable to one-time revenues that were not spent last year. That leads into the fund balance conversation. Uh, we were able to maintain our 3% reserve in our assigned fund balance. We were able to uh, set aside the 7% basic aid reserve that we typically do. We have set aside $2.2 million of state funding reductions, and that is a little bit odd for us to include uh, as a reminder. And as Dr. Waddell said, uh, we received two one-time funding sources last year. Uh, and when we did our adopted budget, we had anticipated based upon information that we had from the state at the time that, those, uh, that there was going to be no funding cut. After the board approved its budget and after we had our public hearing, we discovered that those two grants were going to get a funding reduction. So we have set aside money in our fund balance after the unaudited actuals to offset the loss of those revenues because we've already committed those resources to expenditures in the current year. And that's that $2.2 million. Uh, we did have some state depart, uh, site department and targeted carryovers of about $700,000. Uh, as a reminder, uh, typically or annually, we give allocations to all of our school sites, and if they don't spend those resources, we do allow them to carry over to the next year, and so the sum total of those is 700000 um, When comparing that to the prior year, I would say that's about half of what it has been in the past, and so that shows that our, uh, our sites were spending last year's dollars on last year's kids, decreasing the amount of carryover into future years. Uh, we have assigned a um, million dollars for future technology needs, a million dollars for safety and security upgrades throughout the district, and also a $1 million textbook adoption. I'm going to ask you to put a little bit of pin in that. Um, we have heard that um, <clears throat> there are uh, some textbook adoptions that are going to be needed in the coming years, and we, so we set aside a million dollars for that. This is the restricted fund balance. I shared that we do have a sizable amount of restricted carryovers uh, from one year to the next, and I want to cause your attention to some of those. In the red boxes currently on the screen were one-time revenues that we had received directly related to COVID-19. Um, all of these revenues are slated to be spent during the 2023-2024 school year. That's, again, in the Educator Effectiveness Fund, Arts, Music, Instructional Materials Block Grant, and the Learning Recovery Block Grant. So that there is a little over $12 million uh, there. In addition to that, we do have the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, uh, $8.2 million that was unspent last year. It was, I'm going to say, the first year of the program that required implementation, and we were allowed to carry those resources over to future years, and so uh, there's a little bit of intentionality to that, and we will continue to use those funds to fund our ELOP program that we have brought online. 
In addition to that, we have the restricted lottery program. As the trustees know, we receive two types of lottery funding, uh, unrestricted and restricted lottery. The restricted lottery is required to be used for on instructional materials, and we typically use those for textbook adoption. So the reason why I said put a little pin in that prior slide, we've set aside a million dollars in our unrestricted general fund and coupled with this two and a half million, as of right now, we'd have $3.5 million set aside for future tech, uh, textbook adoptions. Uh, in addition to that, um, I, I, I call these next two slides the trustee Ratterman slides because he's the one that asked for these a couple years ago. Uh, and it is a comparison of the first column, the unaudited actuals. Uh, the middle column is uh, one-time transactions that appeared during the year, and then you have your net that happened on the far right side. So in this case, while we had $382 million of revenue, we had $28.5 million of one-time revenues that were received and recognized during the 22-23 school year. And you can see, as I said earlier, $5 million of that being in federal revenue and $21 million being in state revenue. So if we didn't have, the way that you look at this is, if we hadn't had those revenues, we would have seen that we had $353.5 million in revenue that would have been ongoing revenues that we would anticipate being ongoing resources in future years. We do the same analysis on the expenditure side. So again, $371.3 million in unaudited actuals expenses, $23.7 million of that being one-time expenses. And you can see those being spread out throughout the cat various category expenses that would have resulted in an unadjusted uh, spending of 347.5 million um, there as well. Um, I do want to say a note that while there is uh, 17 roughly 17 million in salaries and benefits. I don't want to necessarily say that those were one time transactions, but they did come out of a one time funding source. So a little bit of a, a clarification on that as well. Uh, finally, I'll ask, answer any questions. Okay, I'm looking, uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you for the report. And uh, just a quick question, as far as I know that um, it's harder for us to account for height, students that are type Title I, Title I, Title I, yeah, Title I. Um, so um, have we accounted for possibly seeing diminished monies from the federal government in regards to those programs or yeah so we are tracking that um in fact miss canable and i were talking about that earlier today in regards to title one years ago we had eight ish title one schools right now we have four or five that qualify for title one and we're continuing to see that decline our, our student demographics are changing um, and so we are seeing a, a decrease in title one and also one of the things that we're also being mindful of when the federal budget uh, which is not approved yet, but when they started uh, having conversations about the next federal budget, there were some sizable decreases proposed to education, and one of those was in Title I. Uh, there was no proposed decrease in special education funding at the federal level, uh, but there were some proposed increases in other education funding sources, and one of those was in Title I. So we haven't made any accounts for that as of right now in our unaudited actuals. We take our ongoing funding sources and we can um, we project those to remain flat or make an assumption to, for those to remain flat, but we keep an eye on that and we will make adjustments as appropriate as we gain more information. And, and I just mentioned that in, uh, as we, as we look at possibly where we put our extra resources, which are, there's not much there, but, um, that we look at those title one schools or schools that could be title one. If, if, you know, all the free and reduced lunch, you know, applications were received or what have you that we definitely uh, support those students as, as we can. Absolutely, and I know uh, this will, year will be a, um, a new LCAP year as well. So it'll give us some opportunities as we redo our LCAP to also look at that as well and how we might uh, factor some of that into our LCAP as well. Trustee Ratterman, then Trustee Muirhead. Yeah, so um, Two things. One, I'd like to get your impression of what you think from attending the tax um, meeting that just happened about the future volatility of it. We generally see uh, tax declines a year to two years retarded from the rest of the community. So we're going down when LCFF's going up. Uh, we also do well when they're going down. Um, it's just a, a quirk. So I'd like to get your impression of what you think's happening. There's, uh, there's quite a few people think we might actually have a soft landing. The second piece of it is I look at the um, 
you know, it, 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 87% of the cost is salary and benefits. Um, 13%, it takes care of everything else in the district. Um, and we have quite a bit of one-time money. So you're looking at 371 million total with the 322, so about 48.6 million is what we are operating the district on right now. If you take the one-time money out, that number drops to something in the neighborhood of 30.8 uh, uh, million. And I don't know if we, what, do you have a sense of when the one-time money runs out, are we sustainable? Can we continue at our current level of funding uh, or do we have to take some kind of draconian action? Thanks. So I will first, I'm going to answer your last part of your first last question first. And that is, do we need to take draconian action? I, I would hesitate to say we have to take draconian action. Do we always need to look at our finances um, and make sure that we have fiscal sustainability? Absolutely. I think that's uh, wise and prudent of any, any organization. Um, certainly, we have significant amount of resources that were spent on one-time purposes. And, um, and I've, I said this in June when I was in front of you as well, that we do have next year a sizable amount of resources this year committed to uh, spending down those one-time carryover funds, and they're not going to carry over, and we're not going to get any. Um, when do I think that those one-time funds are going to end? Um, most of them will end this year. We will have spent all of them by the end of the 23-24 school year. So we will need to look at how are we using those one-time resources, and can we take them out of the unrestricted general fund, or are we going? Is there some other funding source that we can take those out of? And so we are going to need to look at that. But I wouldn't call that a draconian action. I would call that we need to look at what we're doing and how we um, manipulate or not manipulate. How do we change as we go forward in order to react to that ever-changing environment? I just had to have a provocative question. Keep okay, going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in regards to your first question, in regards to property taxes, I would say, um, and I and I will say, um, uh, Ms. Waisaki was at the meeting with me as well, and she asked me a somewhat of a similar question. And I would say it's cautiously optimistic. You know, I was happy to see where we were at that point in time, which was, and I could be slightly wrong with my percentage, but it was like a six point two to six point four percent where we were at that point in time. And I would say that that was a little bit better than I thought it was going to be. Um, so I was happy to see that. Um, the RDAs was a little bit low um, at that point in time, but we only have one RDA now, and that is that was remaining from the San Jose Redevelopment Agency. And so we're in this little bit of an unknown that we don't know what's going to be happening with that. Um, so right now, I would say that um, I was pleasantly pleased with where we were as of that point in time. We have still several months to go in front of us. And yes, you're right. When the state economy starts to dip a little bit, we start to see a softer um, increases in hours. Um, as I said, last year, we saw an 8.4% increase. And that was less than what COLA increased under the LCFF funding formula. And even if we were at 6%, that is less than what LCFF increased this year as well. And so um, it, it's really early to say, um, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do know that what was kind of interesting to me was that there was an increased number of appeals. I'm sorry, there was a decreased number of appeals, but the dollar amount comparison was actually higher than last year. And so that's a little bit of an anomaly, but we also recognize that not all of those appeals get approved. And so we'll have to wait to see what happens in regards to that. I do agree with you. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of pie in the sky and what's going to happen. And I think we're still waiting to find out, especially within the commercial market um, and seeing what happens with a lot of those commercial units that are still showing as for rent. And we'll just have to wait and see. Did you happen to notice, we've got a couple of seconds left. Do you happen to notice whether or not some of the absurd ones like Apple saying that their spaceship was worth a dollar. Yeah, they do those every year. Yeah, I understand. But do any of those those pretty well resolved or we got some big hanging fire out there? Um, I'm sure that there's some big ones that are out there, but none of those that I'm that are causing me the big headache right now. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Trustee Muirhead. Thank you. Um I'm I'm not trying to be um, overly simplistic, just uh, a little bit simplistic. But for the last couple of years, it seems like we've been passing um, budgets where our expenses are higher than our revenues. Mm -hmm. And each time when you get down to this 
spot in time, our um, revenues um, turn out to be higher than expenses, both with and without the one-time transactions. So um, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about um, how we're doing this, I guess. The fact that we, even though we are approving deficit budgets, we don't end up doing deficit spending. Well, I say we would our deficit spending. In fact, last year we deficit spend a million dollars on the unrestricted general fund, um, so that is deficit spending. Um, yes, we also has significant carryover and restrict restricted funding sources, um, and we will spend those this year. And so that will be deficit spending in the restricted fund balance this year. Um, yes, you know, you all know the name Ron Bennett. And Ron Bennett says, you know, when you bring a budget to the board in June, it's approximately right and exactly wrong every single time. Um, and, he, and he's famous for saying those words. And we are providing a budget based upon what we know at that point in time. And our budget is actually developed and finalized before the state budget is finalized. And so there are a lot of unknowns. I think last year was also a little bit of an anomaly that at the time that we brought the budget to the board in June 2022, um, we had not settled negotiations yet. In fact, we had not even settled negotiations, I think, until – was it December or January? And so we – that wasn't even built into our budget at that point in time and wouldn't – and wasn't even accounted for until the second interim report, which would have been in March 2023. And so we're constantly making those adjustments, um, and and with um, – with that, we are seeing some decreases in our reserves as well, and but that was also intentional um, in order to um, provide those salary increases last year. So I agree with you. I don't think it's necessarily this bad situation. It was intentional what we were doing, um, but it's a little bit of this cart before the horse, and, and it's part of the legislative process where we are required to pass our budgets before the state budget is actually finalized as well, and that's that causes some complexities. Um, and I will say it, it causes a, a little bit less of a complexity for us than it does for the LCFF funded districts. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Um, that I, I just like to say it out loud to the public that it, it sounds really bad when we approve those budgets mm -hmm. and then we we figure out ways. I mean, we're not going under, we're not getting taken over by the state. No, you know, absolutely got not. money in reserves. The other um, question I had was around the... Um, site slash department slash targeted carryovers of 0.7 million. And you said, oh, that's such a smaller number because uh, people are spending last year's money on last year's kids. It could also be a much smaller number if you're giving them a much smaller amount. And we did not do that. Okay. That's what I wanted to confirm is that that you we're giving them similar amounts of money and they're just getting better at spending it, not that we're giving them less money. And in fact, we actually increased our allocations last year. Now, certainly some of that would have been offset by declining enrollment. But we actually increased our allocation last year. Per student allocation. Per student, we increased our per student allocation last year. Great. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Canova. I'll make it really simple. On a scale of one to 10, how are we doing? <laughs> That's relative in regards to what? Uh, overall. I mean, are we still the financial powerhouse we've been known to be, or are we less than? I would say that we are still doing very well. Um, you know, there's always areas for improvement. There are things that I have challenged my staff on, on how we can do better foresight and better forward planning um, in areas. So for example, um, and and Mr. Ayala has to step out of the room, but one of the things I've talked to him about is how can we do a, a really robust inventory of our technology systems? You know, every single system that we have in place, every single device and build out a robust um, replacement schedule so that we can actually build the budget to those and anticipate those things in the future. Uh, we need to do the same thing on our facility side, our vehicle replacement. Uh, Ms. Canaval, as you heard, uh, we were talking about earlier today in regards to doing it with our musical instruments. Um, I think those are always some really nice things for us to be able to do and be more forward planning and not just planning for the here and now, but also thinking about that in the future. Um, and to that end, at the next board meeting, we're going to be bringing some information in regards to the results of our facility needs assessment, which will show uh, what kind of facility needs that we're going to be looking at over the next 20 years. So how can we take that data also and begin looking at what can we do with our resources that we have available to us and begin looking at how do we start addressing those in the future? 
So I, I think we're really on the right track and not only just looking at the now, but also preparing for the future. We're still on the shiny city. Uh, let, let, we're a school district, so we're still the shiny school district on the hill. How's that? Um, I I have a couple comments. Um, one, it sounds like you're moving towards that 20 year budget cycle that Sunnyvale does, <laughs> which that's great. I did want to come make a comment and I don't know if it was an intentional statement because sometimes when you're asked on the fly, I don't think we've had a decline in our number of our Title I students. I think the number we've had a decline in the identification of our Title I students. One of the things that I would like us to look at is if our families are filling out those applications because when we've made them, they're all online, which has significantly decreased the number of responses. We have a number of schools that have tried to be creative. They bring out Chromebooks at back to school nights, but I don't think that those we are, we have necessarily that significantly fewer Title I students. I don't think we've identified them. And that's because now everyone gets free lunch. And so it used to be that was an access to food. Now it's not necessary. So I would really like us to look at how we can identify those students because some of those schools that aren't getting that funding don't are the same schools that don't have the robust PTAs and they don't have the nonprofit groups or the $300,000 in their whatever their funding. And so they're not able to supplement when that money is taken away from those school sites. And so I really would like us to look at how we can get parents to fill out those forms so that we really are identifying all the schools that are Title I. You just um, asked a question that every school district in the state is grappling with right now. And that is, you know, it, it's a great thing that we are now able to provide free breakfast and lunch to every student every day. That is a great thing. Uh, but there is a there is kind of that that relation to that is now we've lost a need to fill out that federal free and reduced price meal application anymore. And so every school district is grappling with how to be creative in order to still ask parents to get that application filled out when the carrot, if you will, is gone because meals are already free there. Um, and I will say this is a conversation that's being discussed up in Sacramento. Um, I had a conversation with um, a think tank organization recently when I was up in Sacramento and they were, we, the two of us were just having a conversation, um, a representative from that organization. Um, he and I were just having a conversation about creative ideas of where we might be able to do some things like that um, and, and encourage, how could we do that differently um, at the statewide level rather than by school district to school district and really think about that differently. And so there, and it's also, um, impacting not just districts like ours as community funded districts, but where it's really starting to impact is the LCFF districts as well, because those identifiers also impact the supplemental and concentration grant funding, and that funding is coming from the state to those school districts. And so it's really having an impact on those districts, and there's more than 900 of them in the state. So it is a, it is a big issue that there's a lot of questions to. So one of the groups I think that could help us, um, I realize you you, you want to think statewide, but I'm bringing us back no. to Santa Clara Unified, are our LSATs. Um, they are the ones that are most connected with a lot of our families. And I would love to hear their ideas on what we could do differently to, to get those application backs. They are the closest to those families. They are the ones that in the past have helped them fill those out. And so um, I, I would love for that conversation to be kind of in the model we're trying to be with um, including everyone at the table, but those are voices that I think might have the solution. Our family Resource Center as well. Yeah, yeah. So well, the, let's think about it because I don't want those schools and most of them are, I have three in my district, some that are going back and forth between being a, in my trustee area between Title I, not Title I, Title I, not Title I, depending on what's filled out as far as our application. So those are my comments. Any other comments? Can Or can we vote on this report? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Uh, any opposed? Student Trustee Valdez. Aye. Okay, that passes seven to zero with student trustee Valdez also voting yes. Our next item is our action item um, regarding the consideration of the waiver. I'm going to read what I read before. Um, this is a recommendation from the administrative hearing panel to approve the stipulated expulsion agreement with suspended enforcement for student 0914238.1 to be placed at New Valley High School on a one semester rehabilitation contract. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve, roll call vote, please. Okay. We have a motion and uh, from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes, that passes seven to zero. We now have two information items. Um, N.1 is the... Um, in in M.1 2023 summer programs report. It's just the report, sorry, <laughs> sorry. It's been a long day. I wish I could tell you everything that's happened, but anyway. Should we move that it's a nice report? Should we move, it's a great report. Is there any questions on the 2023 for summer programs report? Awesome. Okay, we now have, um, then we have item N.2, the uh, administrative regulation 51453 um, for non-discrimination and harassment. This has been the work of a, long, a, a lot of amazing individuals who are dedicated to making sure that we serve the needs of all of our students families and staff. Are there any questions about this policy? Trustee Raderman, or this is a regulation. So this does not need to be approved, um, but this is the staff regulation to go along with our board policy. Well, maybe I'm confused. Um, yeah, I'm confused. Are we are we on O one? We're not on O one. We are on N two, the AR for five one. Yeah, no, that that's I'm fine. I have nothing for that. Okay. My apologies. Okay. Anything anyone else would like to say? Good job. Good job. Enormous amount of work that went into it, and those people. It was a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, I would just add, President Fairchild, if I might, that I, yes, I want you to might. thank the uh, LGBTQQIA plus committee who spent a great deal of time and thought on this policy. It's it's gone through many levels of review, and uh, you know we understand that these are uh, important policies for many of our children and families, and are are pleased to uh, see it in administrative regulation. Okay, Trustee Lieberman, then Trustee Canova. Um, I'll be fast. I just wanted to thank Dr. Carrillo and um, um, she's not a doctor, is she, Lisa? She's a JD, right? Okay. Um, and Ms. Strom um, for their leadership on this committee. Um, I had the privilege of being on that committee and um, I'm so proud of the work that came out of the, the committee that created this um, um, AR and um, I'm so excited that after several years of trying to get this done, it's done. Um, I'm just, I'm just so grateful for your leadership and um, for Ms. Strom as well. So thank you so much um, for that. And to Dr. Waddell also for his support of this and his work to make sure that it happened. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Trustee Canova. I just just proud of every, everyone involved, all the hard work, and also just really proud of our district. I mean, it's just, you know, we hear a lot of things in the news about a lot of districts around us in the Bay Area, and we have a great deal to be proud of right here. And in that shining district, I said city, shining district on the hill, 
uh, it's a very shiny place because we have some very shiny people that work very hard and I'm just, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. I would like to um, thank Trusty Lieberman. This has been something I know that she's been passionate about since she got on the board. It was probably the first email that she sent when she got on the board is that she wanted to make sure that everyone was protected. And so I thank you for your leadership on this. Okay. We are now to 0.1, the first reading of board policy and board bylaw updates recommended from the policy committee. Um, so this is our first reading. It's our time to give feedback. So I think Trustee Ratterman is ready. Yeah, so the one here, and I'm not 100% sure this is the right place, but I'm gonna go with it anyway. So on policy number 9322, which um, talks about agendas and agenda materials, you know, for quite some time, I I feel very strongly about transparency. I really want us to have the maximum amount of transparency so people can see everything. I also believe that some of the laws that are out there, a lot of people will tell us, well, the, the Brown Act doesn't require that, or the such and such law doesn't require that. I think those are floors. I think we need to be, uh, I think we need to take a look at things and do what we think is the right thing to do as long as it's at least in compliance with the law. And so there are many areas where I'd like to see us have uh, more product, more things available. So for one of the examples, there's right now, there is a spreadsheet that has public comments that goes to the board the and some staff. Nobody else can get access to that because it requires uh, a, a code. And it shouldn't. If the people are making, just like if they're making comments here, everybody gets to hear them. If they make comments to us on it, they should be, everybody else should be able to look at those comments and see what the public is saying and what they're doing. Also, when we get letters to the board, uh, to, to the board as a whole, I think I'd like to see us copy something that the city of Santa Clara does, which they attach all those correspondences to the agenda item. So somebody sends a letter in that says, I love the budget or I hate the budget or whatever it has to do with any item on the agenda that's attached there. And anybody can look at them and see what's going on. And I think that those are types of transparency that would really benefit this district um, because we don't want anybody to feel we're hiding something. And, and my experience is we, we really don't hide things, but sometimes we hide them by omission. And so I don't know whether we can change the language in here um, to make that happen, but I would like to see us take a look at that and see what we can do to to make it happen. Sorry, are you asking for it to go back to policy committee with those questions? Well, I suspect it would pretty much have to because I don't see how we could micromanage it here. Um, but I was gonna, I threw it out to the board as a whole to see what you guys thought. I mean, if there's nobody else has an interest in it, I'm the only one that thinks this is a good idea. Well, then you don't need to bother with the, the policy committee. You just we'll just go ahead and approve it next time. But I think they're they're items that would be helpful to us. Um, I, I'll comment on that. Um, let me. So your first one is uh, making the written comments publicly accessible. Right. It's currently in a Google Sheet uh -huh. that's sent to the board. It should be something that anybody can access. So one of the things that uh, that I would have issue with that is that most people, what I have noticed, there are people who are who comment verbally, and um, then there are those. That a lot of times, the people, and I've asked them later, what, why they use the the Google Sheet. And it's because they didn't want to comment publicly, but it was a way to contact the board. And so if we were to make something publicly accessible, I think we would make we would need to alert people that these comments will be published so that they can decide if they want their their comments published to the world. Um, the other thing is we could. Yeah, I don't know if other groups are doing Google Sheets, so. So I can give you, to just, just to comment on your, your item. So on one of them, for instance, at the city of Santa Clara, if you send it into mayor and council, they have a, a, a thing set up for mayor and council. Anything that goes in there becomes a public document. And they say it right on there. They say, hey, look, if you send it here, this is available to the whole public. If somebody wants to send individual ones to the board members, 
that's a different story. That should, I don't think that's something we necessarily need to share with everybody because they may want to be able to communicate and stay anonymous, et cetera. And so then it's just be a matter of establishing the policy and how it's set up. And so people know, hey, look, if you want to do something that's public and, and people see it. Right now, if you send something in writing, no one sees it but us. And I don't think that's right. Uh, Trustee Ryan. Um, yeah, I'll agree with Trustee Roderman on that. Sorry. Those they actually are public comments. Um, you know, if whether it's put on the Google document or whatever, if you make a comment at a public to a public officials, even if you email it into one board member, that is a public document if someone wants to request it. So um, I do think we probably do need, you know, and and maybe we need to warn people that, you know, any comment here is a public, you know, is a public record. Maybe you do need to warn people about that. Maybe they feel like it isn't being shared. Um, but I actually think, it, you know, if anyone wanted to request it, it is a public document and maybe we should just do it intentionally from the beginning rather than waiting for someone to actually ask for it. So I get that maybe people don't want their comment public, but if you're communicating to government official, elected officials, it is a public document. So um, uh, yeah, I'd agree. So are you going to comment on this thing or something different? Because I would like to keep the co the comments to Trustee Ratterman's request before we move on to another um, policy. Um, I was going to comment on that and something else. Okay, can we stick with just the, just this one, and we decide if we send it back to policy committee? Okay. Um, okay, I I um, I think that there would be some fairly easy um, solutions because I, I agree with Trustee Ratterman that um, people who are writing in public comment um, during our meeting, it should be just as public as um, if they speak at the meeting, we should publish those. Um, and they send to a specific email address, public comment at or something. So it would be easy enough on the, the I would think, I'm not me doing the work. So um, but we could um, say uh, on the page that says you can email us about any item by using this email address that that is public record and, and we'll start publishing it um, as like an attachment like our minutes. You know, it could be attached with the minutes we're meeting could be the public comment from that meeting. And then we also have a mechanism for people to just send us notes directly because we have an email alias for that as well, board members at scsd.net. And that I don't see as being part of this board meeting. Anyone, anytime can send something to board members at, but it, the public comment item is a public comment about this meeting. So um, I would say if they, any of them could be public if somebody did a records request, but as part of the minutes of the meeting, it seems like any written emails that came in should be attached to the minutes of the meeting. have one member of the public who would like to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I would say from uh, UCSD's perspective, we also support the idea that um, comments that are addressed about a board meeting that come in writing, um, if they're not, if you can't, you can't say they're public if no one can see them. And so for years, I've been telling our members, if you have a concern, and you want the public to hear your concern, you need to come so people can hear you. And it's given them a sense of feeling that I don't want to stand up in public. I'm not a public speaker, I get all that. But then when I tell them your comments are not public then, if no one can see them. And I, I am struck by that. They're not public if they're not public. Ms. Vaisaki has spoken. I think the, is there a, can I just get a thumbs up to send this back to the policy committee? I think we're sending 9322 back to the policy committee to address those concerns that are brought up. Now we'll go to uh, next policy, Jody. I mean, sorry, Jody, Trustee Muirhead. Um, I just wanted to bring it to the rest of the board's attention that we have an item up for approval here on open enrollment 5116.1 that um, 
give some brief um, priorities uh, for open enrollment, mm -hmm. but there's um, actually another BP and AR that go into it in more detail, and it's a more expansive list of priorities. Um, and that one also came to the um, policy committee at its last meeting, and we um, I asked for some changes so that those um, priorities, instead of being in the AR, got move, get moved to the BP so that the community could weigh in and the board could weigh in on those priorities because there were some suggestions to change them. And normally if a suggestion from staff to change an AR doesn't, it doesn't get board approval or community input, the change just gets made. And this seemed to me to be the type of thing um, where the community might wanna weigh in um, when it comes to who should have priority about getting into a school. Um, should there be um, certain, uh, categories of people who get um, more priority than others. So um, so that is not this policy, 5116.1, but it's another one, I think it's 5116.12, that will be coming to us later because we're still working on it in policy committee. So could those come at the same time? Um, um, does well, this, one, does this one supersede? This one now. Does this one supersede the other one? No, no, no. They're oh. they're they're okay. They're related policies. They are not the same policy, but they are related. The the second one that has not come to us yet goes more into the open enrollment process. Um, it's a bit more specific than this one, and so we can approve this one now. And the and the policy committee had no problem approving this one now, um, and then the other one will come to us um, later. Okay. I just wanted to make you aware that there's more about open enrollment and it's coming later because we're still working on it. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Muirhead. Trustee Raderman. So I have one other piece on the same same one that's going back to policy committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it has to do with the language around the consent calendar. Um, what it states in there, I'm not going to read it, the paraphrased version of it. It states that any board member can pull an item from the consent calendar. And then it goes on to say at the next paragraph, any member of the public can talk about an item, has an opportunity to talk about it on the consent calendar. I'm the one that actually brought the consent calendar to the district. We didn't used to use it prior to, to, to my involvement. And it was always intended to be something that anybody, a person from the public, a person from the board, anybody could pull the item. If you don't do it that way, and so um, a item is on there that a person from the public wants to talk about, and then they, they get up and they make their, they have their conversation about it, you get put in a very awkward spot because you haven't pulled it off the consent calendar. And so maybe board members want to have a conversation. My feeling again is that if there's something on the consent, the idea behind consent is that everybody agrees. And so if there's somebody from the public, if there's somebody from the board, if there's somebody else that wants to talk about that further, I think anybody should pull it off the consent calendar. It'll then be dealt with the normal way you deal with an item and go ahead and, and go through the process that solves all of the query, you know, the comment problem, because the comment problem, you know, there's an opportunity for the public, it's an opportunity for the board, everybody can speak. So it would take about two word language, two words to fix that in the policy committee. And then say any member of the board or the public can take an item off the consent calendar. So that would be my other suggestion. I, I suppose the policy committee could look into that. I'm trying to, look back on my, I haven't had as many years as anyone else on this board except for Bonnie. Um, I don't remember a member of the public ever pulling an item from consent. I don't know that we have so, ever had somebody. We have, okay. I mean, I I feel like we've, like generally they are, they can, they contact the board. I, I just, and, or we'll say they haven't, you know, an issue. I just am concerned about saying that a member, I, a member of the public could contact the board, but I don't want it to be come a free for all with the consent. Well, I don't, first off, it's a very rare event that happens. Yeah. And secondly, I mean, the same policies used for the city of Santa Clara, some others. I did have a conversation with Mark Shield. Maybe he's got some additional input um, about this. But I don't think it'll be a problem. I think it's one of those things where we might be making a problem when there isn't one. I think if you just quietly put that in the in the language, 
if somebody has something, because the other thing is if they're got enough moxie to get them to say, I'm concerned, I'd like to talk about that item. That's something where we probably want to hear what they have to say, because most people are afraid to get up at that podium. And I think we try it. And then because that's how it has been, as far as I've known, ever since we put the consent calendar in. It wasn't until I saw this language that I saw something different. So my thing is put it in there. Let's see what happens. If it suddenly becomes a problem, then maybe we'll have to address the problem. But I don't think it's going to be a problem. And occasionally there's going to be somebody that has something that's very important to them. They want to have a full discussion on it. And I think we should afford them that. That's my 10 cents worth. Policy committee can take a look at it, come back with a recommendation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shield, did you want to weigh in? So I did have a conversation with Trustee Rotterman about this, and at um, Dr. Waddell's direction, I contacted legal counsel about this just to kind of see a, a preliminary thought on this, and, and she's continuing to do some more research. Um, the initial comment in regards to that was that, and I will say to Trustee Rotterman's comments, yes, there are certain things that the law says that you have to do. And then there may be the ability to do something else above and beyond that. So the law requires the, to give the public an opportunity to speak to any agenda item. And the consent calendar is one of those agenda items. And, and we, in our board bylaw, also allows for members to speak to the agenda item. So that even as a consent item as a whole, there would be that ability to do so. What council did say was oh, giving the public the opportunity to pull an item from consent calendar is not something that the public typically does. Even now, the public doesn't have the ability to say, hey, I want to pull an action item from the agenda. So why would the public have the opportunity to pull an item from the consent calendar? That is a task of the governing board. According to our council and my conversation with them, it is the task of the governing board to add or pull items off the calendar, not necessarily the public to add or pull items off of the calendar. Even if the public wants to add an item, we have a board policy that governs the process to do that. So she is continuing to do some more research on that and, and, and looking into case law, but that was the initial comments that I had with council um, after, after Trustee Rodderman. Can I, I get spoke. some clarification on something? I, yes, of please. What you just said. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're using the word poll in the same way, because there's moving something from consent to action that's called polling mm -hmm. from, from consent. And then there's pulling something off the agenda, which means removing it. And I don't, I don't, I would never want to give a member of the public the ability to take it off the agenda, right. but moving it from consent to action so that we can have a discussion is also, we also use the word poll I, I'm, I, can it's, you clarify it's, what it's you It's the mean? latter one, pulling it from consent so that where there can be a discussion, but it's- They, they weren't okay with that, the, the, the lawyer? Council said that that is typically the responsibility of the trustee to make that motion and vote on that because that requires a vote. That is the responsibility of the governing board to do that, not necessarily the public. Can We'll have trustee Ryan, and then um, this is on the same agenda that's being reviewed by policy committee. I was just going to like following up on that question. Um, so the member of the public would have the opportunity maybe at the, at the time the agenda is adopted to say, Hey, I'd like to you to, I'd like to ask you to move that rather than doing it themselves. Is that, or letting someone know in advance, right. Too also. Right. But they would have an opportunity at the meeting when the agenda is adopted. Cause we do take comment at that time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Canova. I just want to say I really appreciate that you had a conversation with an attorney about this. Thank you. Uh, any, I have a couple policies that I was wanting to talk about. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so one of the policies that I've actually didn't know was going to be on this agenda, because I'm not on policy committee, but I've had several conversations about since the start of the year, is policy 6146.4. And what it is, it's about um, the standards for students with disability for graduation. We used to have in a policy, just a line that said, students with IEPs may have foreign language waived. Um, that line was dropped, I believe inadvertently, um, and has caused great confusion. <laughs> 
throughout the district. So I would love to add that line back in. It will be coming back to you next time with the line added back in. Okay. And in the meantime, we are also working on procedures for foreign language waiving for students with disabilities. This is, a, it wouldn't, won't be in this policy. It will be in 6146.1. That's where it was before. Okay. This one okay. has to do with um, this is lowering the graduation requirements right. to 120. Right. And this is a brand new CSBA policy. Yeah, I was a little con I was a little confused as well, you know, and so I'm glad that's coming back with that beautiful line back in. One of the things that I also want to make sure is understood when we put the ability to waive foreign language in as a board, it's not contingent on them attempting foreign language. That if a student is given that ability to waive foreign language because of their disability. I don't want there to, there's some people that put pressure on students in the past who have maybe have a severe auditory processing deficit that they want them to try. And if the student wants to try, of course, let them try. But if the student is entitled to that waiver, we cannot withhold that waiver just because of a desire of ours. Yes. And that statement actually says that the decision is to be made by the IEP team. Right. The other thing is that um, you're right. It should be directly connected to their um, disability. And luckily, both of our sites have ASL as a choice too. So hopefully we have some students that if they have, uh, they would like to try more of a tech, uh, 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 kinesthetic, kinesthetic, thank you. Uh, attempt at foreign language that we also have that if that would be a student's choice. So that's another way to solve that. Because the one thing we want to be careful about, if we take, if that student happens to be on a four-year track and we say, well, we waive foreign language, we have to be very clear to them that we've just take them off the four-year track. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trustee Ratterman, you had a comment? Yeah. Since I, I'd like to see it go back to policy committee, only from the standpoint of taking a look not only at this policy, but also the policy that was just referenced by uh, Ms. Knabel, um, so that there is no confusion. There seemed to be some confusion here from one of our really well-educated. Uh, well, it was a new, I didn't realize this was a new policy, a new number and everything. My point being somebody else with less knowledge than you have uh, would look at that and be maybe completely confused. So what I'd like to suggest, is that one, we look at the new policy that they've done versus our old policy or whatever the updated policy is and make sure that there's no areas where they conflict. Secondly, if there's gonna be something like that, that there be a reference in this policy to say refer to policy such and such for graduation or whatever it is. So that if you look at one, not knowing that there's other policies, you've got a reference to go back and forth. And for, oh, okay, there it is, I found it. Okay, this one, Suggestion. yeah, and this one is actually completely different, the one you're seeing tonight, which is why we put this one forward and held the other one back because we knew that was missing and that that was a um, something that the policy committee asked us to figure out to find that missing statement. Um, this one is new law that is completely different. It some of our other student groups um, can yes graduate with the California State High School graduation requirements. This policy now includes that our students with disabilities can also have that option, with the caveat that they that their parents and the student are are talked to in ninth grade because they have to take the special assessment um, instead of the CASP. So this one is completely different. So I think this one might be okay and we really need to bring back that other one. My, my concern was like, if a parent tries to read this, they may not be able to go back to that. Somebody naive like me tries to read this, they may not be able to find it. And so, so whatever we can do to make it clearer, even if we just put a little paragraph, by the way, don't forget there's this such and such some, some other place. So if we, uh, so what you're asking is that we put in this, just please refer to 616.46.1 regarding graduation requirements. Whatever the correct my, language is, My yes. notes from the policy committee meeting says that when we were discussing 6146.1, we, I have notes here that say that we'll put in something that refers people to 6146.4. So... We 
both ways. But yeah, so it, they'll reference each other. So we'll just put that in here as well. Can we do that? Okay. All right. So my, uh, I'm it's not always there. Uh, la, la, la. Oh, yes, there is. There is. There is. I just saw that. Okay. No, but this policy that we want to approve tonight has, has it. He already has. We're not approving it. It's our first reading. Yeah. Okay. So it does have it. I, I just didn't have it with. It. So this makes a little more sense now that I know that this is the brand new policy. I understand what this one's for. And the other one is it would have come back to us, except we. Um, ask for a couple of other changes, including adding the reference to the one that we're approving tonight. So it'll come back to you soon, I think. Okay. All right. So I also had uh, some questions on policy 5141.5 mental health. And this is just because we have a lot of mental health professionals that work in our district. So we have our what we call our mental health associates that usually work under the supervision of our wellness coordinators who are fully licensed mental health professionals. And the license is different than a credential. Our wellness coordinators are generally licensed. Now on this page three of this um, policy 5141.5, it talks about a school counselor, school psychologist and school social worker may provide mental health counseling to students. Now, one of the things that I think is different with some of these, um, the school social worker doesn't necessarily have had experience with counseling. Um, if you look up the credentials. And so, and the other thing that is not um, noted in here, there's just a nuance with the school social worker. They're not necessarily licensed social workers. Um, they could just have gotten their bachelor's degree in social work. So they're not necessarily licensed social workers. And so when we're talking about providing mental health counseling, I want us to really think about um, the, I, I, I would just like us to look at the credential requirements for these and just to talk about the, who we want providing that mental health counseling. I mean, at, as a former school psychologist, I felt like there were certain counseling cases I was prepared for by my year-long my year-long internship that was supervised. And there were certain counseling cases I always referred out because I didn't feel like I had the background to handle that type of case. Um, and so I, I like this, sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to be, what page are you on? I'm on the top of page three. It's, so it says a school counselor, school psychologist, or school social worker may provide mental health counseling to students in accordance with the specializations authorized on the individual's credential. Now that credential is very broad. It's very different than a mental health license. And so I, I, I just wanted a little more specificity. Uh, additionally, um, we have had in the past, sometimes because there are so many different um, mental health licenses, we haven't, there have been times where we've had what, like say a school social worker associate or a MFT associate, and that associate is the key word for intern, and interns need to have supervisors. And so if we have any associates on like that fall under the counselor, school psychologist or school social worker credential, they need to have a supervisor. And so I guess I would really like us to kind of, I don't know if this is a personnel issue or a policy issue, but kind of flesh that out because we are providing those mental health services on our campuses. I want to make sure we have the right people doing that. And it could be the right person it could be the, the right person for one type of uh, dis disability or, or mental health challenge. And it can, that person could be the absolute wrong person with the wrong background. And so I would just, I don't know if, again, I don't know if this is policy or if this is uh, HR or, so I, I would love for feedback from the board on. I'm not sure, but maybe it sounds more like uh, an AR. I'm not sure if that's where we can uh, accommodate that. Board policy is usually a little bit more broader, and we, I mean, I'm not sure we're going to actually. You're exactly right. I really think it's probably an AR, and maybe we can just have the 
staff look into that because I do think um, we need to be very clear on who we want to be providing those mental health services for our students. So do you want to bring this one? No, the, if, if we can work on this in an AR, I'm fine bring for this policy going forward. Uh, Trustee Raderman. And you're, that topic's finished, right? Okay, good. So um, there's an, another policy in here, and I realize this may be a bit pedantic, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's it's board policy 6173.4, uh, education of American Indian students. There's a lot of controversy over an appropriate name for um, Indigenous peoples of America. Um, and I think we maybe want to take a, a little bit of a look as to whether we want to use that. Unfortunately, the California Indian Education Task is one of the definitions, so you know it may be at, a, at odds. So that's something. Uh, you know, originally the name Indian came from Cl Christopher Columbus, and there's been a lot of a lot of issues associated with it. So I just want us to take a look at that and see if there's maybe a, a more appropriate name, whether it be indigenous people, whether it be um, BIPOC, or whether it be something like that. Can BIPOC, I respond? Won't, BIPOC won't work, but something like that. Can I respond on that one? Um, yes. Um, so that is a new policy generated by CSBA. They name their policies. So, um, so that one is actually their name. If we change the name, Correct me if I'm wrong, staff. We get into all sorts of headaches because now our, our they're out of they're out of whack. Um, so we've had times before where we've had issues with like the homelessness, uh, unhoused, you know, with the, the different changing terminology where we've sent back to CSBA comments like, hey, can, can you consider updating the name of this policy? We may want to do that with this one, but the, it is a brand new policy that, they, that they've just come up with. Well, I, I know there are certain portions of our population, certain parts of indigenous people that consider it offensive. So I would rather us find a neutral term that doesn't create that problem uh, if it's possible. So perhaps what we do is we send it back to them and ask them to correct. If not, we might just take the initiative. We have modified CSBA titles, et cetera, before, uh, maybe to bad effect, but we have done it. So it, it's, it's something I want us to take a look at. I think there's an area of sensitivity here. And maybe we can find a find a solution. Maybe maybe they'll say, "Oh yeah, you're right. Let's fix that right away." Maybe you can bring it up to Trusty Gonzalez. Something I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe it's something we can move <laughs> move this forward while staff looks into it. Uh, I see. I see staff <laughs> staff trying to give a comment. So I'm going to turn it over to Miss Knave. There might I um, Trustee Muirhead is right. I know it, when you change the title, um, then whenever they do an update, it doesn't match. And so then we have all kinds of trouble. There might be some way to change or add to the language within the, to explain, to, to use a different term. But you'll also notice that all of the state ed codes below it and everything they refer to in, the state has all of those ed codes named that way, which is probably the reason for them keeping that same title, I'm guessing. It's sort of what we run into with English learners and multilingual learners and emerging bilinguals. The state, everything still says English learners. And so we kind of get stuck in this quandary, especially around policy. Okay, thank, thank you. Is there a, a desire to send that back to policy committee or move it forward? Move it forward? I, the okay, sorry, Trustee Ratterman. Any other policies for this first reading of the policy committee? Okay, now we have items from the board. I did receive a slip. I apologize. We already closed public comments, so you can just email the board your comments. Okay, so we will now go to report from the board. Madam President, would it, would it be fine if I? Gave her my time. I, I mean, I we have had a lot of comments, and I just want to keep our precedent, our precedent, where we have our comments at the certain time. Okay. It, Trustee Raderman. So we're coming up on. Um, first off, it's been a it's been a great great few weeks. Lots of back to school nights, all kinds of things like that. Um, always fun to be out and mingling with uh, the parents and the students and hearing what's going on and exciting. 
Coming up on, um, for some people, Friday, but most people, Saturday, Sunday is the Art and Wine Festival. And there are quite a few great activities out there. Our um, Westwood, no, excuse me, Wilcox's PTA, Santa Clara's PTA, the Santa Clara Schools Foundation have all joined with Rotary to pour beer and wine. And that the profits from that will be split evenly between the, the nonprofits. There's a couple of others in there, PAL, um, one of the Rotary programs will be split evenly. So if you're out there enjoying the libation, keep in, keep in mind that it's going to a good cause. Also, just on a personal note, I will be from 7, 7.30 to about 12.30 in the pavilion, uh, taking people's money for the pancake breakfast for Boy Scouts. Love to see you come by. It's an excellent thing. It's their primary fundraiser and they do a remarkable job. It'll be for both the boys, three, nine, Troop 394, as well as the girls, Troop 2394. Um, and I don't want this to go too long, so I'm going to stop. Thanks. I just want to mention, as uh, your Metro Ed representative on that board, um, I, I did pass around a little booklet that they put together as far as photos of uh, for last year. And um, I believe our, our superintendent is going to have a meeting with our, that superintendent. And she'll be visiting us here in the future to talk about the program. And hopefully uh, I don't know, she'll bring up something like this, which shows the number of students in the program. And it has a five-year five year, uh, enrollment window showing what it was. So just a little bit of information on that and uh, she'll be bringing, the, bringing you that forward when she does that. Um, I wanted to congratulate our um, Assistant Superintendent of um, Human Resources, um, Dr. Gonzalez, because I learned that you are being honored as one of the Eastside heroes. Um, so I was very happy to see that and wanted to congratulate you and uh, it's a great honor, so. And that's all I wanted to share. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for bringing that yearbook for Metro Ed. That's really, really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think it's, it's, down, it's down there. <laughs> but but it's very very nice and, and impressive numbers. Really really good stats. Uh, Trustee Lieberman. Um. I, uh, real quick, I attended the um, Math Pathways presentation at Peterson um, on, I don't remember what night, what, Tuesday. Um, and um, it, it was really, really well done. Um, I encourage families, if you have not gone to a presentation, I think there's four more, uh, three more, thank you. Um, please try to find time to attend. It's worth your while to go and listen and understand what's being proposed. Um, you can ask questions, you can provide feedback. Um, and um, I really, really recommend that our families try to get out to one of those. Um, and uh, one last thing, I drove by Patrick Henry yesterday and the demo has begun. And so uh, I know the community is very excited to see progress. So thank you to um, our bond department and all the people that are in charge of getting the people to knock down the buildings. It's very cool. Thank you. Thank you, student trustee Valdez. Thank you very much, President Fairchild. This Monday, I did have the opportunity to meet with some of my fellow student senders in order to not only come together to explore what was new and upcoming, but to also be able to understand what is happening with the math present of the math pathways presentation. And that was quite an enjoyable experience. On top of that, this coming November, I will be serving on a panel for AEC um, that will be in San Francisco on November 30th to December 2nd. And yeah, thank you. Oh, at the AEC, is that what you said? Oh, that's very cool. Trustee Mirhead. Um, well, I wanted to wish all of our Jewish families uh, uh, Tova. It is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, Friday night and Saturday. So um, we will be celebrating this weekend. And I wanted to comment, um, there have been a lot of anti-Semitic attacks and um, actions that have taken place nationwide, but also um, very close to home here. There was a recent um, bomb threat in a synagogue in Los Altos Hills and one in the East Bay, and it makes it very real when it's in our backyard. Um, and I just wanna say that I appreciate all the efforts amongst our staff um, 
in the areas of equity and inclusion um, and teaching our kids, our students, what's right and what's wrong and, um, and the importance of um, being inclusive to everyone. Um, there's been school districts around, there's one in the East Bay that's taking the opposite tact. And I just, um, it's just awful to see and to hear about. Um, so I appreciate all that we are doing in those areas to stay strong and um, and teach our kids what's right. Thank you, Trustee Muirhead. Um, last night I was able to join by um, Mr. Stam and Ms. Meltzer at the New Valley back to school night. And I was just so impressed. It was so awesome. Um, and they use a lot of tactics to get, it's hard enough to get high schoolers there, but their turnout was amazing. And I there's a, a picture in my mind that I'm gonna keep um, uh, in, just just keep with me this year. And it was of their videographer teacher in his room. I there there were students that just loved showing the work that they'd already completed there. And I was watching a, a young um, teenage girl show her mother her project, and she was so proud. And and those are the types of things and and the magic that you can see happen at a school like New Valley where they are being so innovative and creative and, and creating these in, engaging courses for students it was a beautiful moment that I I'm going to keep with me so thank you to the staff at New Valley there was more going on but that one just stuck out to me um and the administration there so <laughs> We're going to adjourn, but we're going to adjourn in memory of someone uh, very special to um, the Department of Special Education. Barbara Simonoff um, passed away in September. And Barbara's, Barbara started at the school district in 1965 as a school psychologist. And for those of you who don't know, that was before the initial special education law. So she was, and then she retired in 1997 as director of special education. So she was on the ground as things were unfolding with how to educate children, which we're still working at. I am going to read part of her obituary. Barbara pursued goals in special ed, such as bringing inclusion to the district, having kids that happen to have special ed needs together with learning with others in the classroom. She championed this and she could champion this because of her skills and friendships of interdisciplinary colleagues. And this is was her strength, her skills and her friendships. I don't know anyone that wasn't her friend. Teachers, psychologists, speech therapists, and of course, parents who, who drove this work and advocated for what's best for their child's education. Barbara looked for new ways to support students that considered both a child's developmental challenges and their sparkling special abilities by researching subjects like whole brain functioning and other innovations so that teachers were equipped in the classroom. She was a fabulous grant writer and so was able to find funding for these often cutting edge projects that were not funded. When she retired, she was so beloved in this district that her retirement party had to be held at Central Park and hundreds attended, hundreds attended. I met Barbara when I, shortly after I came to this district and she is probably the one of the classiest humans with the biggest heart I've ever had the privilege to know. So it is in her memory, the biggest heart, that we adjourn this meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Student Trustee Valdez. Aye. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.